Is this is this working? Test. Oh, it's out. It's good now. All right. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Hello. You guys are having. You guys are hard to get attention. It's like talking to a bunch of boxers this morning. More social than anything else. All right. So good morning. My name is Chris Ye, and I lead the product teams here at Box. I'm Box's head of product. And on behalf of Connect 16 and our team here at Box, I wanted to welcome you here to this event today. And um, let me tell you just a little bit about Box if you don't know. Box was founded in 2005, so we're about 11 years old. And what we do is we help companies and organizations manage their files in the cloud. So if you think about where you store information today, you store them on your laptops, so you're storing files on your laptops, maybe on network drives, uh, files are still hard to move around. Um, we solve those problems, so we exist to kind of solve those problems for large companies. About 66% of the Fortune 500 are Box customers today, and we load about a billion files a month into Box. So all the stuff that you guys do in your organizations around files, those are the things that we manage and do here. Uh, this is our Redwood City uh, headquarters location. This is worldwide headquarters for Box. We have about 1,400 people in the company. About 700 of them work here. Um, none of them are here because I'm the only person here with a computer science degree that's up this morning. Um, and um, most of them, you'll start to see, this place will get super busy in just a few hours. And um, I think we've already sent out a note about how boxers can eat the food that was prepared for you um, because they're going to come in and want to eat that. So. Um, so what I'd like to do is just introduce the folks here from, um, you know, from Connect 16 and also uh, the two folks who will um, go ahead and moderate today. So I'm very pleased to introduce um, Assemblyman Mullen and Supervisor Slocum. So I'll let you guys come up and uh, guys have a great day. Morning, everybody. You probably noticed that uh, Kevin and I both have blue suits on. We both have no ties. We both have the pocket thing going. We both have the tan shoes going. And no, in case you're wondering, we did not call one another this morning and coordinate our wardrobes. So it's great to be here at uh, Box. What a great crowd. What a wonderful. Uh, facility, facility this is, and to be hosted at one of the peninsula's newest technology buildings and one of the most innovative companies on the planet, Box, located right here in the heart of Redwood City and also right on the train corridor, which I think is very cool. And this place, I think, is an example of our collective future in terms of technology companies on the peninsula. So could we just give it up for Box right now? You know, our very first Connect conference was in 2013, and that conference was held at YouTube. How many of you were there at the very beginning? A fair number. Um, the theme of uh, the Connect 2013 was strengthening communities through social media. Facebook hosted Connect 14, and our theme was changing technology for a changing world. And last year, we held the Connect 15 at the GSV Labs just down the road here in Redwood City, and our theme was strengthening communities through technology. When you think about it, that lineup of those events was amazing because of the diversity and wealth of topics that we dealt with during those three years and those conferences. But that was then and this is now. We believe that this year's theme of disruptive technologies is the best ever and our program format and location is frankly 
the best ever. No offense to Facebook or anybody else, but we're all very pleased to be here. Kevin and I are very excited that Peninsula TV has joined us, and uh, you can catch the replay of these segments on Peninsula TV Channel 26 on Comcast. Um, thanks to Chris Yeah, the Senior Vice President of Product, for his warm welcome, and a shout out again to Box for hosting us. The breakfast was uh, delightful, the fruit was fresh, the coffee was hot. I enjoyed it. I don't know about you. Also thanks to Sam Cita. Sam Cita. That stands for the San Mateo County Economic Development Association, for those that you might not know. And its leader, um, who has always been there for us at Connect and been there in everything, frankly, that we've ever done um, in District 4, I'd like to introduce you to Roseanne Faust and thank her for her strong partnership and continued support of this here event. Thank you, Roseanne. Also, you know, I know we're all very busy, and so I thank you for taking time out of your schedules to join us here this morning at O Dark 30. Um, I'm proud to serve in a county where local government leaders are interested, engaged, and in fact using technology to better serve our collective constituents. You know, we've said this sort of in a different way before, but Kevin and I have always been interested in innovation, disruption, and redesign, especially in the public sector, especially in government. All of, you, all of, you, all of us know that despite being here in the heart of Silicon Valley, the innovation capital of the world, that government seems to always lag behind the private sector. And that comes at the, at the same time when the demand for 24 by 7 government services, online information, mobile apps, and more have become a steady drumbeat. And we've all been working very hard to update our technologies and tools to save time and money in the process and remain relevant and helpful and helpful to our constituents that we serve. Each of the four conferences that we've done have been designed to look ahead, to look ahead to the future, to give our audiences a glimpse of the future and what's on the technology horizon. And we've always hoped to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck has been. Um, obviously, Kevin and I are very proud of the Connect series. Um, we find that our roles as uh, legislators are really being challenged as we think about how to apply rules and regulations uh, for policy development in the areas of privacy, fairness, transparency, safety, consumer protection, and disruptive technologies like ride booking services, home sharing, autonomous vehicles, and Redwood City actually has a pilot program for drones. Did you hear me? Redwood City has a pilot for the use of drones. Who, who would have thunk that a few years ago, right? So as we kick off Connect 16, you're going to be introduced to people who are changing the way that we have approached some of the most fundamental aspects of our lives, like driving, like voting, like raising money to support candidates and campaigns. and even teaching our kids and one of the panels that I'm really looking forward, in addition to all the other panels, is the Disruptive Food panel. You're going to love that panel, Disruptive Foods. How about that? In any case, I'm personally very excited to get this event kicked off. We're on a very tight time frame. Um, we have a timekeeper here who's giving me the signal. And so I want to turn it over to my partner in crime, Assemblyman Kevin Mullen. So let's give it up for Kevin. Thank you very much, Warren. Uh, first of all, an audio level check. Can you folks hear me in the back? All right. Joe Gothel's giving me the thumbs up. All right. That's, that's good to know that we are being heard. And um, let me just give a very quick thank you to Warren, who is really the uh, intellectual, uh, emotional, social, uh, 
uh, passion behind this um, event. And I'm just kind of riding his coattails. Uh, but we uh, have a great partnership going here. And yes, we are dressed alike. Essentially, you're looking at me in a few years, right, right there. Just that's, get, get used to that. Um, let me add my thank you to Chris Ye, Senior Vice President of Product, and the staff here at Box for hosting us. You've heard me uh, touch on this theme for those of you who are uh, Connect alums uh, from previous years. Uh, the confluence of education, high tech, and biotech in Silicon Valley that is driving our innovation economy. The MIT Technological Review, a publication that has been in existence since 1899, publishes an annual list of top 10 technological advances for the year. Let me briefly cover eight of those 10 for this year, 2016. Immune engineering, genetically engineered immune cells are saving the lives of cancer patients. Novartis Pharmaceuticals with facilities in San Carlos is a major player in this field. Precise gene editing in plants. A new gene editing method is providing a precise way to modify crops in the hopes of making them yield more food and resist drought and disease more efficiently and effectively. Caribou Biosciences, headquartered in Berkeley, is one of a handful of firms uh, doing worldwide research. Conversational interfaces, powerful speech technology from China's leading internet company, Baidu, makes it much easier to use a smartphone. Baidu opened a research facility in San Francisco in 2014, and this is one of their projects. Another one, robots that teach each other. What if robots could figure out more things on their own and share that knowledge among themselves? Well, a team of professors at UC Berkeley are some of the key players in advanced robotics. Another one, DNA App Store. An online store for information about your genes will make it cheap and easy to learn more about your health risks and predispositions. Helix, a San Francisco-based company, secured more than $100 million last year in a quest to create the first app store for genetic information. Solar Cities Gigafactory, a $750 million solar facility in Buffalo, New York, that will produce a gigawatt of high efficiency solar panels per year and make the technology far more attractive to homeowners. Solar City is headquartered in the 22nd Assembly District here in San Mateo. Slack, a service built for the era of mobile phones and short text messages is changing the workplace. Slack, based in San Francisco, gives you a centralized place to communicate with your colleagues through instant messages and in chat rooms, which can reduce the time you have to spend on email. Another one, Tesla Autopilot. The electric vehicle maker sent its cars a software update that suddenly made autonomous driving a reality. Tesla was founded in San Carlos and is now headquartered in Palo Alto. In case you're wondering, and those were the eight, in case you're wondering, uh, the two rounding out the list were reusable rockets. Rockets typically are destroyed on their maiden voyage, but now they can make an upright landing and be refueled for another trip, setting the stage for a new era in spaceflight. SpaceX, based in the Southern California city of Hawthorne, has been the most successful to date. And finally, power from the air, internet devices powered by Wi-Fi and other telecommunication signals will make small computers and sensors more pervasive this being driven by the University of Washington. So you may have picked up that I specifically mentioned the location where these innovations are happening. And the list reinforces the notion that the Bay Area and the peninsula in particular are the epicenter of these disruptive technologies. If you look at our agenda and speakers for today, it touches on many of the technologies I just listed. Little did we know six months ago when we began planning this conference that we would overlap with MIT's selections. In keeping with the spirit of innovation, I am pleased to announce that thanks to Peninsula TV, Penn TV 26, today's conference is being live streamed and the feed is accessible at our website, www.connectsmc.org. And on a final note, for those of you here using social media, 
we encourage you to use the hashtag ConnectSMC on Twitter and Facebook. And please like us. That would be fantastic. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner in crime, Warren, for our first introduction. Do you think that Kevin and I ought to stand together so you can get, you know, like a selfie with Warren and Kevin and then use the hashtag? Would you like to do that? No? Nobody's interested? Okay. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, TED Talks because these conferences in large part have been patterned after uh, TED Talks. And previous attendees will remember that we've included snapshots of new technologies and ideas I'm out modeled after those TED Talks, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the concept, TED is a nonprofit organization uh, devoted to spreading ideas worldwide. It started in 1984 as a conference bringing together people from the worlds of technology, entertainment, and design, thus the TED um, tag line. Since then, it's become even broader, and you can lore, learn more about TED if you'd like at TED.com, obviously. But here's the key. TED conferences bring together the world's most fascinating thinkers and doers who are challenged to give the talk of their lives. No pressure, Melissa. No pressure. Uh, in 18 minutes or less. But for our Connect Talks, we've got uh, the presenters are going to have just nine minutes. So it's going, to come, it's going to go fast for all of us. Uh, we have three Connect talks today interspersed between the panels and the keynotes, just as a matter of uh, orientation. And you're going to learn about some of the most fascinating things that are happening at the intersection of technology, citizen engagement, environmental sustainability, and government. Quite an exciting agenda, amazing speakers, amazing venue. Um, I'm really pleased uh, that we're able to do these Connect talks. And let me turn it back to my colleague, Kevin Mullen. Thank you, Warren. And because that exciting agenda is so tight, we're going to dispense with the formal introductions and speaker bios. I would normally say you could read the bios in the program, as you probably noticed. And we, as we warned, we've gone paperless uh, for this conference. So instead, you can read all the bios on the Connect app. And if you have not downloaded the Connect app, our first presenter will tell you how to do so and why you should do so. So please join me in welcoming Senior Sales Executive with Crowd Compass, Jonathan Garner. Jonathan. All right, there we go. How's everyone doing today? Perfect, perfect. Is anyone on their like tenth cup of coffee like I am? I can't. I can't remember the last time I was actually up at five o'clock this morning or five o'clock ever. Um, so first and foremost, I really appreciate everyone letting me come here today and talk. It's it's great to get in front of people, and especially when we're talking about disruptive technology. So probably two questions on your mind right now: What is Crowd Compass, and how long did it take him to tie his bow tie this morning? particularly at 5 a.m. So uh, before I get into a little bit of background about our company and, and the app that we help Sam C to b build for this event, want to just kind of take a look at a bigger picture. When we're talking about disruptive technologies, when you look over the last 10 years, and, and it's, it's weird to think that coming 20, 2017 is the 10-year anniversary of the iPhone, but when you think about mobile apps and, and how much they've impacted our lives, I would almost argue it's been one of the biggest disruptions in technology. Because think about it. In the past, when you needed to deposit a check, you'd have to go to the bank, you'd have to wait in line, it would take forever, and then maybe the bank's closed by the time you get there after work. Now I open up an app. I take a photo of my check and I'm done. I can deposit all my checks laying in my bed on a Sunday morning. I don't have to get up. I'm, I'm based out of uh, Richmond, Virginia, so when I flew out here on Sunday, 
I went to the airport. I was already checked in. I had my boarding pass. All I did was walk, drop off my bag, and I was good to go. And now they have apps where you can go in and you swipe left or you swipe right. And if someone likes you, you now have a date an hour later. So it's really interesting to think about how much apps and technology have changed our lives. And, and, and when you think about how frequently we're using this and how fast the adoption of mobile apps has grown, we've adopted smartphones and mobile apps at a, a, a pace that was double the adoption of television, which, which is, is weird to think about. So when you look about how much time we're spending on our phones, companies and organizations and communities have had to completely change their whole approach. They've had to change their marketing strategies. They've had to change the way they engage with their consumers. Because when you think about it, we all carry around our phones everywhere. Oops, hang on. There we go. Sorry. I forgot there was a pause in the PowerPoint there. When you think about how connected we are, and how we don't like to be disconnected anymore. When I, or when I was landing on, on, a, on my airplane, before the wheels hit the ground, my phone was back on. I was checking my emails. I was checking in with work. I was, I was checking Facebook and, and tagging that I'm in San Francisco now because I don't get out here that often. It's now an integral part. Um, it's 70, and here's just a, a fun fact for everyone. 71% of people between the ages of 18 and 44 have their smart device on or around them 21 hours a day. So now with all of these communities and organizations, they now have a way to stay in continuous, constant communication with, with their target audience. And so more specifically, what we do at Crowd Compass is we help organizations, communities, nonprofits, and associations develop a mobile app strategy for a lot of the events that they host that are designed to bring people together. So like the event today, there's a mobile app. And you're thinking to yourself, well, why would I use a mobile app at an event? Well, because it's, it's designed to help deepen the engagement. Whether you're at an event here, you're out in your community, mobile apps are designed to really engage everyone at a deeper level. And it's, it's caused a lot of organizations to really expand how their event is set up. So for example, here, the mobile app went live weeks ago. So as an attendee, I can go into an app, I can look at all of the other attendees on an attendee list and see who else is going. I can start planning my networking. I can choose who I want to connect with long before I get to the event. And now I've already planned out my entire event before I've ever set foot at the event in this awesome building and had the amazing Mexican scramble. I actually, <laughs> sidebar, I actually used my phone to take a photo of that, that tag because I want to go try and make it when I get back home now. Um, but as you can see, mobile apps are just changing how we're interacting with people. But one thing to keep in mind is mobile apps aren't changing what we're doing. They're just changing how we're doing it. Another example, and I like to use this when I do a lot of our mobile app demonstrations, because in the app there's a gamification component. You know, it encourages you to interact with each other. It encourages you to take photos and share your thoughts. So one of the things that, that we want you to do is take photos and post. You can do that straight from the app. And by doing it in the app, we're going to pre-populate all the hashtags for you so you actually don't have to remember which hashtag to use because we're going to help you with that. And that really creates a community within a community. And so that's really our big goal. And that's really the direction I see a lot of this technology taking is really deepening that level of engagement and connection amongst each other when you go to events like this. And so... I, I'm probably not going to take the, the full nine minutes. Uh, I want to make sure we can get through this. But I really wanted to come up and kind of just share how our specific niche in mobile apps is really helping organizations and communities and businesses and nonprofits and associations really expand their reach. Because once this event is over today, later this afternoon, the mobile app's not going to die or go away. You can still engage. You can still communicate. You can still reach out to others and share thoughts and ideas. So now we're taking an event that is traditionally one day or two days or three days and turning it into a year-round engagement. And that's really where a lot of this technology comes into play. It's no longer we're going to talk and meet today. We're going to talk and meet yesterday, today, and the next several days, the next year, the next month, the next, next uh, you know, six months and, and, and down the road. So with that being said, if you haven't downloaded the mobile app yet, please do that. If you go to the, the app store, search for Crowd Compass directory, 
hit download, and you'll see Connect 16 right in there. Um, if you have questions about the technology or the education or maybe thinking about developing a mobile app strategy for some of the events that you have, come talk to me. I'm going to be here. And if, if we don't get a chance to talk today, all you have to do is download the mobile app because I have a profile in there with my email, my phone numbers, links to our websites. And so I'd definitely love to hear from all of you. So with that being said, thank you so much for letting me come up here and talk for a few minutes. I really appreciate it. And I hope I get a chance to talk to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. If we could have our panelists come up to the stage. First of all, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for the presentation. This is uh, a panel that I've been looking to, looking forward to uh, for a little while. Um, let me ask you, are we, uh, are we all glad that that presidential election is over? Some of us wish the election were still happening based on the results, but that's, that's a different story. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna get political. They warned me. We are going to touch on this presidential uh, election very briefly, uh, but our topics uh, will go deeper and we'll be focusing on um, things happening on the state and local level and the role of technology uh, in our democracy. So elections uh, and the administration of elections, democracy issues in general, are a particular passion for Warren and I. Warren is our former chief elections officer in San Mateo County. Uh, and, and myself, we have been uh, keen observers and participants, uh, passionate about issues, candidates, campaigns, and how that translates into public service. Each of our panelists have um, uh, an active role in the disruptive aspect of elections, and they are positive disruptions. Last year, I authored legislation to allow the County of San Mateo to pilot an all-mailed ballot election in an effort to encourage voter turnout and contain costs. While a paper process doesn't sound like a disruption, it is. It changes the time frame, the convenience, and the turnout model. Dr. Melissa Michelson, a political scientist and author and elections expert, studied the all-male ballot election and wrote a report to the legislature with her findings. She's an expert in minority turnout and the engagement and disenfranchisement of minority populations, and she will be sharing her observations with us. Once we've examined the results of the all-male ballot election, we'll hear from Jude Berry, a Santa Clara County consultant, writer, and startup co-founder who is working on another disruptor, the use of electronic signatures for voter registration and signature gathering. And finally, Matt Mahan is the CEO and co-founder of Brigade. He rounds out our panel. He created the world's first social network designed to help voters take back control of their democracy, elect politicians who keep their promises and influence the policies uh, and elections. We uh, will hear how this played out in the 2016 election. And I know in my script I said I would uh, start uh, with Melissa, but I am going to start with Matt because I just heard an NPR uh, story on the radio about how Matt and his app properly predicted the election results in advance when virtually every pundit and expert uh, that at least I listened to 
had predicted a big win for Hillary Clinton. So I'm uh, deeply curious about this. So point of personal privilege, I will open uh, with Matt. Matt, how did your app detect what was going to be happening before the so-called experts did? Sure. Uh, let me give just a little bit of context on what we've built, and then I'll, I'll answer that. And good morning. Thank you all for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, we started Brigade two years ago to solve the problem of citizen dissatisfaction with the political process. We uh, have felt for a long time that people feel disconnected from their representative government. In fact, even those of us in the room who I know are very engaged probably don't even know the names of most of our representatives. You are each represented by something between like 30 to 40 elected officials. When you get down to the long tail of local electeds, most of us don't know their names, feel very disconnected from the decisions they're making, and sort of show up once every two to four years to make a decision, and often don't feel well informed and I think that uh, creates an electorate that is susceptible to misinformation, to sound bites, uh, and to constantly being kind of disappointed and dissatisfied. So to jump into what we did for 2016, part of our mission is to help people better understand what their representation looks like and who's on their ballot. And so we built a tool to help people understand the candidates and the ballot props, how they align with those things that those decisions that they can make based on their issue positions, based on their political beliefs. And then we have a tool for them to pledge their vote and then go gather votes from their social network. So you could say, okay, I'm most aligned with candidate B, I'm gonna pledge my vote for her, and because I've connected Facebook and my email and phone contacts, I can now go recruit votes from the voters who live in my district who I think are likely to uh, care about the issues that I care about and I think this candidate represents. That's the basic idea. So starting in the primary, we allowed people to pledge their votes to candidates. We noticed early on disproportionate support for Bernie Sanders. I think that was sort of an indication of enthusiasm. Ultimately, we did not predict that one. I should also say, our, we're not a polling platform. Our goal is not to predict elections. We're a voter empowerment and engagement platform. We're really an organizing tool. But something interesting happened when we got to the general. We got to about September and noticed that an unusually high number of registered Democrats were crossing over to pledge to vote through our ballot tool for Donald Trump. And, and this is, we're a national platform. We have hundreds of thousands of voters spread across the country using our tools to fill out their ballots and recruit their friends to vote with them. And, you know, frankly, I, being unfortunately not as data-driven as I aspire to be, I looked at the data and thought, well, this is just a conservative skew. We seem to be appealing to conservatives. These are probably just conservative Democrats who vote for Republicans anyway. What's the big deal? So I didn't really think about it again. And it wasn't until election night when we saw the results coming in that I remembered what we had seen three months before and we went back, in fact, our team was so excited, we can't, not necessarily excited about the result, but our team was so excited about the, the data that we came, everybody came in early the day after the election and started pouring through every, everything that we knew about these voters. And what we found when we normalized the data is that in specifically Midwestern and Rust Belt states in particular, registered Democrats, and especially white women who are registered Democrats, were crossing over to pledge to vote for Donald Trump at significantly higher rates, in many cases double our baseline. And when we compared that to swing states in which Donald Trump did not outperform the polls, that phenomenon was not happening. In fact, it was much lower than the baseline. And I don't want to suggest, one, we're not a polling platform. I also don't want to suggest that Democrat crossover was the only reason, but I think uh, the only reason that, that uh, Trump surprised the polls. But, but what I think it does indicate is that polling has some major gaps. And one of the neat things about the new tools that we're building today is we can actually measure behavior. We can see what people are doing in addition to what they're saying. And I think supplementing polling data with behavioral data is going to be part of the future of predicting political campaigns. Excellent. Excellent, Matt. I appreciate the, the overview. I am going to turn to our professor. Um, I want to have you uh, discuss the all-male ballot election in, in San Mateo County, what occurred there. But since we're talking about what happened uh, on the national level, I'd love to get your reaction. Um, 
you know, we live in this era of big data and um, precision and science. And there were so many polls that were flat out wrong. And Jude Berry, as a political consultant, I'd love to get his take on this too. Sort of how did everybody get it so wrong on the national level? Um, and then I'm going to get Jude's comment, and then we'll come back and we'll really dig in on San Mateo County. But um, your observations about what was not detected uh, in uh, the polling. Okay, so there's a couple of things to know about polling. Okay, now it's green. There are a couple of things to know about polling. No. Now it's flashing. How about now? Okay, cool. So. You all probably um, are familiar with this phenomenon. Uh, your phone rings, either your, your cell or your home phone, and it says uh, unidentified caller, and you do not pick up. So it is a growing phenomenon that it is super difficult for pollers to get people to answer their questions. And the really high-quality polling organizations are supplementing with... Um, opt-in internet-based polls and other methods, um, panels where people are compensated for agreeing to continually give their opinions. But polling is getting more and more difficult. And it's not random. So not only is it more difficult, which makes it more error-prone, but we also know that people whose candidate is not doing well are less likely to answer. So if you're a Donald Trump supporter, and all the polls and all the news is telling you he's going to lose, you're less enthusiastic about calling the phone and saying he's your guy. Versus if you're a Hillary Clinton supporter and you see that she's winning, you're a little bit more likely to pick up the phone. So, so polling's getting much more difficult, and it's biased. Um, and so I have to agree with this idea that we have to look at behaviors, and we also have to figure out a way to make polling work. Luckily, that's not my job. So uh, I told my students, look, we all looked at the same data it's not, not my fault that I was wrong. Um, but the folks who do polls do have to figure that out. It's officially dead. Okay, we're, we're going to trade this one back and forth. So, Jude, you're a political professional. What happened? I don't know. Uh, well, let me uh, elaborate a little bit on what Melissa said. I thought she accurately sort of identified the challenges with polling today. And I uh, whispered to Matt earlier, there's no shame in saying you're not a polling platform these days. Um, uh, but it, there are challenges with polling that Melissa's articulated. Uh, some of you may remember what was called the Bradley effect. I think that was an impact. And that was when uh, the polls had Mayor Tom Bradley running for governor of California winning. And then on election day, he lost to George Duke Majin. And uh, the theory back then was that a lot of people would not disclose, were unwilling to disclose to people on the phone that they didn't want to vote for the black mayor of LA. Um, I think to some degree that happened on both sides here, that people did not want to say they were supporting Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, except when they were comfortable in a peer-to-peer -peer platform where they could be more honest. But call, you know, to a stranger on the phone, that's a little challenging in some parts of the country. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is that there's a hurting effect with pollsters. Just like scientific research, which many of you may be familiar with, if you have an outlier poll that says Donald Trump is winning by 5% and nobody else in the nation has a poll similar to that, you're likely not to disclose it. I mean, in, pollsters don't use all the data, don't disclose all the data they have. They, have, they make choices and they make guesses about what might be accurate or what might um, uh, be consistent with other things they're reading. So I think just like the scientific community does the same thing, if there's an outlier you know, research project, sometimes you're not going to see that published just because of either uncertainty or embarrassment or it's not what the herd is saying. I think pollsters suffer from that as well as other communities. And my only observation uh, about the election is how disappointing I was that so many people didn't bother to vote. Even in a presidential election cycle, we have a real challenge in California getting folks to vote in um, off-year elections, in gubernatorial elections and local elections, you see those numbers uh, really plummet. We uh, do a pretty solid job in San Mateo County, but there's still large swaths of people who are not participating. So I do want to bring uh, Professor uh, Michelson back to talk about our experience in San Mateo County. There's a general move statewide to uh, go in the direction of what is now being called the San Mateo County model, uh, which I'm proud of. 
Um, and I'm going to make sure everybody uses that from here on out, but where all of the counties in a phased way adopt uh, all vote by mail with these high-tech uh, voting centers. So, uh, Melissa, you're an expert in this arena. What did this local uh, experiment tell us, and where is this moving uh, in the state of California? So, um, the San Mateo model is not just everybody getting an absentee ballot, but also the ability to use a universal polling place. And that's where the technology comes in, and that's actually crucial. There have been a lot of political scientists who have studied vote by mail because there are other states that do pure vote by mail. And for some people, that's uncomfortable. They, they don't want to mail in their ballot. Um, they like the community experience of going to a polling place, or for whatever reason, they just don't feel comfortable and they want to go to a polling place. But these universal polling places are awesome because it means that you don't have to worry about going to the one that you're assigned to right next to your house, that because it's uh, the polling places are linked wirelessly back to the county elections office, whoever in the county goes to any one of those universal polling places, it picks out the appropriate ballot with your local races and you can vote. And so one of the great things about this new model is that instead of having thousands of provisional ballots cast uh, by people who maybe went to the wrong polling place because they forgot that they moved and they didn't re-register, there were a minimal amount of those because it didn't matter which universal polling place you went to. And so I think that's where the technology really helped. And what we found in our analysis is that uh, not only did voters really like this model, but it increased turnout across the board. Um, and as a scholar who's interested in the participation of uh, historically disadvantaged communities, I'm happy to say there was no disadvantage. In fact, we saw turnout jumps pretty much across the board. So um, it's easier for folks. They like it better. Uh, it has the potential to save a lot of money. And uh, it's all due to this technology, really, of combining vote by mail with universal polling places, and the, and the combination of the two is the key. So Jude, you are an expert in the convergence of technology and democracy. Um, the voting by mail uh, experiment, which is now turning into really a, a statewide wave of moving toward voting by mail, to me it seems like it's probably, uh, even with all of its advantages, uh, efficiency, participation, all those kinds of things, it still seems like a bridge to a time when we are engaged in digital voting. We're not there yet with the threat of hacks and so forth, but where is this conversation moving, not only in the administration of elections, but, but qualifying measures uh, using electronic signatures and, and all those kinds of things? How is technology being employed or not being employed properly uh, in our democracy? It, it, it's moving and it's moving slowly. So San Mateo County and other places that are comfortable with technology will move quickly, but um, I've worked with registrars around the country, and that's not the case. You don't have a Warren Slocum in, North, in every county in North Carolina, for example. Um, counties still live on paper. Uh, uh, Chris, the gentleman earlier, was talking about mobile, and unfortunately, that's, you know, the, 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 every consumer is is moving in that direction every organization, every industry, but not county government and, and not state and local officials who run our systems. They, they live on paper. We created a, uh, a, a mobile app to allow people to register to vote on either an iPhone or iPad or touchscreen device. And uh, our challenge there is working with different people around the country is, you know, we can go to and say, hey, you know, in Santa Clara County, they've approved this and it's gonna save money and it's easier for the user and it's just better for government in general. And I was greeted with sort of bewildered looks because as one rural registrar told me, look, this sounds great, but we're not Santa Clara County. And uh, Millie in our office has been doing this for 20 years and she's got a filing system where things come in and she files them and it's paper and you gotta give me a piece of paper. So we actually ended, so, so we had two choices, one is uh, try to force feed technology on governments, particularly in other parts of the country, or give the governments what they want. In, in essence, they were our customer. Uh, and so we created uh, a system where you, you, the user, could sign on a mobile device, and a robotic arm 
would sign a piece of paper holding a pen with ink in it, and we could give the registrar a piece of paper, and we could give you the user interface you like. Now, we had to create that because government loves paper. Uh, and these signatures, which uh, I, I've, I've shown Kevin and, and Warren, are indistinguishable, so it's great technology. But the only reason we had to do this sort of hybrid um, system is because government lives, changes slowly and lives on paper. And we did this uh, in two cycles, so Obama for America rocked the vote, and the Clinton campaign this cycle as, as well. And I, if we get into a, a PowerPoint, I can show you a little bit about it. But um, you know, our choice was very simple. We could either wait for government to catch up or to technology, um, or, uh, but you know, it would mean all the millies of the world would have to either retire or die uh, before that happened. So we had to basically change our technology to accommodate. I just want to jump in and, and note that there are places that do uh, wireless internet-based voting, Norway, Switzerland, uh, some cities in Canada. So, you know, we don't have Warren anymore, and most of the country doesn't have a Warren Slocum to push that sort of technology forward. But I think eventually, if we do all of our other stuff on our phones, and we do our banking on our phones, we will eventually vote on our phones. It's just, we're just not ready yet. And Matt, I want to ask you a question about the role of social media and campaigns. For the first time ever, we've had a winning presidential candidate essentially use Twitter to go over the heads of the mainstream media to communicate directly to the public. And of course, that was echoed and um, shown on mainstream media. But really, it was a smartphone and 140 characters communicating with a national electorate. So where, where is this conversation moving? Well, I like to say that um, when thinking about civic engagement and how we can leverage technology to spur greater engagement, I think there are essentially two problems. There's a, there's a Google problem and there's a Facebook problem. The Google problem is an information problem. And I don't know that we necessarily need social media to fix it, but we need someone in the civic space to help people make sense of their government. It's too big, it's too complicated, none of us have the time to make sense of it. There are 520,000 elected officials in the country, 85,000 government bodies that can make rules and have representatives elected to make those rules. Average American, as I said before, is represented by over 30 elected officials. Government and aggregate spend $7 trillion touches every area of life, it's too much. But information technology takes complicated information and personalizes it and makes it bite size and gives it to you when you need it. And it should be a solvable problem. So that's the Google problem. The problem I'm more interested in, which gets back to social media, is the Facebook problem, which is that we have a declining civic culture in this country. We have very rich social lives and we have very rich professional lives and we've retreated from the public square. It's uncomfortable, there aren't great ways to connect, it's very easy to, because the country's so big and complicated, that complexity issue makes it easy for us to step back and say, I'm gonna let the experts figure this out. This is beyond my pay grade, I don't have the time for this, somebody else needs to solve it. And unfortunately, I think that's gonna ultimately be a serious risk factor for the country. And I, I don't mean to be alarmist, but I do think projecting out over the coming decades, if we don't have an engaged and informed citizenry that has a sense of what's going on and is informed on issues, and maybe more importantly, you probably face this every day, the real trade-offs that our government has to make and the tough decisions and some empathy for what those decisions are, we're gonna have this increasing divide between the voters and their government. And that's a real that's a real risk. And so when I think about the role of social media, a lot's been written and is going to be written about the nefarious ways in which groups can uh, propagate misinformation to mislead uninformed and disengaged voters. And I think that's a worry. But I think there's a flip side to that, which is that we can create new cultural norms and new expectations around civic engagement using tools that people like to use today to stay in touch with other people. We found on Brigade that giving people some validation that their opinion matters, or that looking into an issue and forming an opinion is valuable, getting some, some validation from a friend that it's important that they did that, significantly increases their likelihood to dig in deeper and want more of that. Showing people that all of their friends are voting, and if they don't vote, they're gonna be left out. It's not cool to not vote. Um, these sound like simple, obvious things, but 
it's not going to happen in the offline world anymore. The place where people manage their reputations and their personal brands has moved online. And there needs to be a social benefit to being engaged and participating. And frankly, I think there needs to be a social cost to opting out and not participating. This is essentially a collective action problem. And I think the, the bright side of social media when applied to politics is that. It's that it can be a proactive place to engage, to learn, to make it social, to make it interactive, to get validation, to get a social reward and status for engaging. And we've got to look out for the dark side, which is uh, basically the fact that we have completely democratized the ability to create and disseminate information, which means that we have a real problem with identifying what's true. And I, I don't know how to solve that, but I, I think it, every technology is two-sided. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad, and we, we've got to maximize the benefit and try to minimize the cost. Kevin, can I you. make a quick comment on your reference to Twitter? Um, one of the things I, that struck me is what Donald Trump said in his acceptance speech uh, election night. And the, his first sentence was that this was a, a movement. And I thought, and, and it, well, it struck me because he'd been saying it for some time, but I, I didn't fully realize that a movement beat a campaign. That the, you know, the Clinton campaign uh, used all the tech tools that many of us have used and developed. Um, and it was a pretty good campaign. They organized, they had money, they knew what they were doing. Uh, but, it was, but it was a campaign and it was up against the movement. And, and, and the only way a movement can work, uh, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, is if it has tools that allow people to connect. So, I mean, this is what Matt's talking about, but uh, you know, Donald Trump would not have worked eight years ago. Uh, Donald Trump would not be able to do what he did 10 years ago. But it was, it was a movement that used these tools really effectively, obviously, but it was a movement versus a campaign, and the movement won. So, Professor, you're talking to um, mostly young students uh, in class who have just come through this election cycle. Um, the millennial vote, I haven't seen hard numbers there. My sense is um, some folks were very, younger folks were turned off by this. You're also, uh, by, the, by the tone of the campaign, you're also an expert in Latino turnout. There, there was supposed to be a Latino surge in this election. Did any of that materialize? What do we know about young people's uh, engagement in a presidential process? And then the really hard question is, how do you engage uh, folks in off-year elections, state and local, where so many decisions are made that affect people's daily lives? That's a lot right there I threw at you, but I know you can handle it. So we do have a lot of data, actually, although, yes, the data is still coming in. And millennials were not as excited by this election. They were excited by Barack Obama's candidacy. They came out and voted for him. But we didn't see that last week. We did see a Latino surge uh, across the country in areas where there are high percentages of Latino voters. They came out in massive numbers. That's uh, visible not only in states where we were looking for it, like Arizona and Nevada, um, but also in places like North Carolina and Virginia uh, and New York. There aren't enough Latinos in the Rust Belt to have preserved Hillary Clinton's alleged blue wall, but Latinos did come out in massive numbers and they probably um, did contribute to her victory in places like Virginia and Nevada. That's, that's pretty certain. Um, how do, third question, how do we get folks to participate in off-year elections. Uh, actually, I wrote a book about that. So there's a lot of things that you can do to encourage people to vote, and a lot of it is about making sure that they feel like um, there's this social pressure that Matt kind of talked about, that you're, you know, you're going to lose face, basically, if you're not, but also just making them feel like they're being asked to participate. So uh, reaching out to them in whichever way um, is appropriate for that campaign, whether it's door-to-door -door canvassing, whether it's uh, phone calls, whether it's sending out text messages. There's all kinds of apps now that you can use to get folks engaged. But it's really about um, making sure that people feel like um, they're being invited to participate and that their voice is important and that that's done in a way that's, that's meaningful to them. And um, social media and social pressure has a lot to do with it, 
Um, but work that I've done in past elections, for example, uh, with Warren, show the power of text messages, show the power of emails from someone who's a trusted source. Uh, we also have evidence uh, from other social networking kinds of platforms that it, it's it's really about just asking them to participate, and that doesn't mean sending them a glossy postcard in the mail or running ads on TV. That doesn't do it. So. Uh, Jude and Matt, I, I wanted to get your take as well, how these uh, digital tools that we're talking about can be employed to engage uh, an electorate of all ages in non-presidential cycles where you don't have a Barack Obama at the top of the ballot or on the Republican side, you don't have a Donald Trump um, who is dominating media coverage and, and creating a movement and an upsurge. How do you use these tools and get f folks engaged and interested Maybe even when there's not an election, when there's just governance happening and decisions are being made by their local public officials that affect them when, let's face it, it's not the sexiest uh, thing in the world. Uh, how, do you, how do you do that? Well, I don't think anybody has the silver bullet. Um, I, I think, I, I mean, essentially to oversimplify, I think it's about reducing the cost and increasing the benefits for individuals. I think we, um, not that we're all perfectly rational economic man here, but I, but I do think that right now it's too hard to follow along, particularly for younger voters who don't subscribe to the newspaper and don't have enough context. And so I think that making it really easy, pushing information that's personalized, that's highly relevant, knowing where a voter lives, what he or she cares about, um, history of participation that might shape what he or she is likely to engage with can in increase personalization and relevance for people. So sort of reducing the cost, delivering it to them where they are on social media, on their mobile devices is part of the equation. And then I sort of spoke before to the cost side of it. One of the experiments that we have run and we just ran in this election and we'll be getting data in roughly Q1 is a controlled experiment. We actually worked with a guy named Donald Green who does a lot of voter turnout experimentation to design a, um, basically the way it worked is we found 20,000 voters on Brigade who were willing to give us a phone number and opt in to get uh, text messages from us. And we divided the population in half, half randomized, and uh, half received, no, they were the muted group, they received no communications. The other half received communications, um, there were a series of five text messages in the week leading up to the election, including election day, in which we invoked social pressure. So a lot of the, um, as Melissa was referring to, a lot of the leading research shows that being asked directly, particularly face-to-face, -face, particularly from a trusted source, uh, can have a significant impact on voter turnout. And so we don't have the data yet. We're really excited to get it back, but we think that delivering that message from a friend or invoking a friend who's also voting, showing, uh, reminding people that the voter participation uh, records are public and that people could potentially know whether or not you voted. So a little bit of, uh, of subtle pressure, maybe not so subtle pressure. Um, and delivering it to them via text message on their phone where they're going to see it even on their locked screen where it's hard to miss. We think that combination is really is really promising. It's one experiment, but we feel pretty good that it's, it's likely to increase turnout. In a presidential race where anywhere from 65 to 85 percent of registered voters could participate, the effect may be lower. But next year, we have a number of local races. I think um, 50, roughly 50 of the 100 largest cities in the United States are electing a new mayor next year. Turnout in the primaries for those races will be often around 10 to 20 percent, and in the general, more like 30, 35 percent. So we have a, a serious drop off in off cycle elections, and we're hoping that invoking social pressure, delivering it, uh, through mobile and um, making it really easy for people to understand what's on their ballot is kind of the, the three-pronged approach to boosting those turnout rates. Uh, what I would add is I, th I think it's a real challenge because uh, if people have seen the polling and the surveys. Millennial voters don't uh, have a lot of faith in government and politics. I don't think it's going to change. Now, they have a lot of faith in civic engagement, and they're looking for other ways to do that. Um, including on, on sites like Brigade, but uh, they don't have a lot of faith in our system, and they don't have a lot of faith that it's the way to change either their corner of the world or the globe. So I think it's going to be very hard. Uh, now, perhaps this is a, a sort of a defining 
moment in their lives. So, uh, both my um, son and daughter voted for the first time this year. And so I was sort of lamenting as a parent, geez, you know, they've got two really interesting choices, right, for their first vote. And we've nominated, two major parties nominated the two most unpopular people in America. Um, but perhaps it will be a defining moment, just, you know, the way other major events have been defining moments for other generations where this was a shock to their system, particularly my daughter, who voted for the first time uh, this year. And, and, you know, maybe this will sort of spur her to do something about it, to get involved in politics and government. Um, uh, but I, I think it was, it was an interesting election. It may be very disappointing. It may be a shock to a generational system, perhaps, and, and perhaps some good comes out of that. So uh, Matt talked briefly, and we will be opening up for questions momentarily here if, if you um, have some comments or questions. But Matt talked a little bit about the, the, the role of Facebook and Google and news and fake news, fake news stories. Uh, in, in some ways, we're in a post-fax era uh, where it's, it's very hard to um, you know, properly uh, identify a site um, with facts with true information that everybody can agree on. So, and what's happening is there's a self-selection of news sites and mobile devices. Mobile uh, devices make it easier for people to self-select the news. So you have an increasing polarization uh, because people are getting their views reinforced consistently. Uh, and so I'm just curious about this role of technology and maybe in, in a negative sense, how it's dividing the country um, because the tools are there to self-select. And how do, we, how do we get beyond that? How do we create more of a common uh, set of facts and a common uh, public square where people can have a respectful um, sharing of views using technology in a, in a positive way? I have no idea. I'll offer one idea, which is that there's a debate right now, I'm sure you've all heard, and Mark Zuckerberg has weighed in on a bit, uh, what is Facebook, just to take Facebook as the, the primary example, the, the, I think this applies to any social media, what is the responsibility of a social media platform to uh, police the truth, essentially? And I think it's a really tough question. My current perspective on it, having thought about it a bit and talked to some, some people on the inside, is that it is a really difficult proposition to expect a company like Facebook and their staff to be the arbiters of truth because there are so many shades of gray. And while, yes, there are terms of service and there's a point beyond which you have you know, hate speech, for example, that's, that you can identify and remove from the site, there are a lot of other shades of gray between something that's clearly uh, hate speech or... Um, or, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of the, the, or personal, directly personal attacks you could ban as part of your community guidelines. There's a lot of other subjective opinion-based content that's going to be really hard to manage. So I think the more fruitful approach is for a platform like Facebook to build better tooling for the community to self-police and to better flag things and, and serve up counter-arguments or highlight for other people. This might be in dispute. You could look at Wikipedia as a really interesting example of this. You, you often will see at the top of an article, this is incomplete or people have disputed some of the facts here or there's a counter-argument to this. And I think we need some sort of similar tooling for communities on social media to do a bit more self-policing. And um, after the 2012 campaign, Teddy Goff, who was the digital director for Obama and served the same role in Clinton campaign this year, um, said uh, people don't trust um, government. They don't trust politicians. They don't trust the media. Who do they trust? They trust their friends. So, you know, if the town hall is now online and people are getting information from Facebook, they're going to trust their friends. And I think, I think that's sort of the, the major answer to your question, Kevin. Um, now, if you have dumb friends, you've got a real problem. <laughs> Professor, uh, the role of civics and education um, in terms of educating young people about what we do on the local level and the, the state level, um, have we moved away from that? We're here at the epicenter of Silicon Valley. There's so much emphasis on STEM, and, and that's all wonderful and incredible, and creating a pipeline to some jobs that are being created. But how do we uh, build citizens? Uh, 
how do we strengthen citizenship in our schools among our young people? So voting might be habitual as opposed to just motivated by uh, a figure at the top of the ticket. Yeah, luckily California is one of the states where if you go to a public college, you are required to take a class in California politics. Uh, Menlo College is private, of course, so you can only take it as an elective, uh, but that's one way. So states like California and Texas um, have a way of requiring students to become civically um, engaged and educated. I think it would help if we had more requirements like that, to be honest. So there's some more legislation for you to pass. But, you know, students, students at Menlo College, they they get a pass on that unless they're already interested in politics. And then they take my class, but that's self-selected. But the more you can make it a requirement, I think it would help. Um, many colleges, including Menlo, also have a community service requirement, which I think also does help because if you're going out into the community and you get involved, I think that naturally leads to political engagement. But unfortunately, I think it's one of those things you have to force people to do, to learn, to learn about politics because they hate politics. They don't trust politics. You know, they're not interested. And so unless it's a requirement, they're not going to do it. Okay, we want to open it up uh, for questions uh, from our audience here for our panel of experts. Uh, and we do have a microphone, right? We do have a microphone that's going to be uh, moving around. So if you have a question, Joe Gothel's in the back, standing up. Let's get him a microphone. Joe, are you the current mayor of San Mateo? This is the mayor of the city of San Mateo, Joe Gothel's, who has a question for our panel. Thank you, everyone. Um I believe Democrats won six of the last seven presidential elections, the, the popular vote. And we've seen that the, the trends of uh, demographics are, are in that direction, even though we didn't see it in this election. I'm wondering, do we really have to create access to technology in order for, the, for those emerging demographics to feel empowered to vote? How important is that? And secondly, a comment for Kevin. Thank you very much for the all-male ballot. We were hoping in 2018 you might have an experiment with an all-female vote. Is that to me? Um, it's funny that you say that because we, we did a public opinion survey as part of the evaluation, and we called people and asked for their feedback on the all-male ballot election, and we quickly had to change the word to say all-mailed ballot because people... I uh, thought we were saying M-A-L-E instead of M-A-I-L. Uh, I do think we have to reach out uh, because politics, um, the demographics may be shifting in the direction of uh, more naturally democratic electorate, but unless people vote, it doesn't matter. And who knows what the election outcome would have been if more folks would have voted the Rust Belt is mostly white and so not wouldn't necessarily have changed um, the outcome of last week's election, but just because the electorate changes doesn't mean people will vote. So I do think we still need to be doing outreach and connecting people, making it easier for them to register. And there have been an amazing number of studies done that show that um, the key is to uh, combine making it easy and making people think it's worth doing. If they think it's worth doing, then even if it's hard, you know, they'll wait in line for eight hours. If they, if it's super easy, but they just think it's not important they won't bother to show up. So we have to do both. We have to make it easy, and we have to make it something that people want to do, and that requires uh, changing the laws, making it easier, and also making sure people feel engaged and think it's worth taking the time. I, I, Melissa's absolutely right. Uh, you know, uh, those of you who work in technology know that if you can reduce friction in the process, it just makes people easier for, to participate, right? We have a lot of friction in our process. I've talked a little bit about the paper system and all that. Um, uh, I'll tell, let me tell you just a, a real quick story. When we gathered our first sort of test case signatures using our, our mobile technology for voter registration, it was on the San Jose State campus, which was just a couple blocks from my office. And uh, we, the campus Democrats set up a table for us, helped us collect votes. And uh, the pitch was, you know, at a table with them, we'd say, hey, do you want to be make history? Do you want to be the uh, one of the first people to register to vote on an iPhone or an iPad? Um, you would think, uh, I thought, as you probably would, that the immediate response was, yeah, that'd be great, right? No, it was uh, bewilderment. They looked at me and said, you can't do that already? Right? These, these, these are people who are, you know, especially anybody under 30 is a, uh, a digital native. 
many of us are digital immigrants. They grew up with technology. They assume that you, know, you can do everything with your classes online. You can bank online. You can do all these other things online. And yet, you have to fill out a piece of paper. Or fortunately, now, you can register online in some states. But we have a lot of friction in our system. And we don't make it easy for people. If we make it easy for people, perhaps they will participate more. But that's a lot. Uh, that has a lot to do with motivation, as Melissa has suggested. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Let's start. Let's go here, uh, Marie, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Hillsborough, M Marie Zhuang. Um, I'm intrigued uh, by your comments, and one of the things that I thought the, the lack of participation is the confusing information that we're getting. We're so distracted by the um, online discussions, uh, the headliners, and it's hard to distinguish the differences. And also the perception that politics is dirty, which I find it ironic. I find that um, politics is something that we are uh, attracted to have a debate and disagreement and come to some kind of consensus. So how do you, uh, how do you suggest that we move toward that direction? Because I think that once we have the idea that politics is dirty, politicians are dirty, then that sort of stop the discussions going further. You talk about people shy away from the public squares. I was struck by the um, notion that our founding fathers, when they had the elections, people go to the town squares, they announce vehemently, passionately about their candidates, and they are not shy away from that. The, the, this elections where people have the secret voters, supporters, I find it troubling. Yeah, it's a great comment. And uh, I, think, um, I think one of the things that's missing is feedback loops. So we talked a lot about the ways we can use technology to reduce friction and um, make things easier, reduce costs, which I think is kind of the, the obvious place you go with technology initially. Let's make it more efficient. Let's make it easier. I am very confident that we're going to solve that problem. We're going to make it easy to register. We're going to make the information more accessible. There is still a matter of belief that I think is, is something we have to address. And it's not enough to make it easy, simple, efficient. You also have to believe that it matters. And I think one form of feedback, which I've talked about and I think is the lowest hanging fruit and why I'm investing in social media to solve this problem, is social feedback. So we talked about that. Easy to get, we can create new cultures. I call that the Facebook problem. Can we get you to feel validated and, and special because you participated and your friends tell you it matters? There's a harder kind of feedback that I would encourage all of you involved in government in particular to think about, and this is not my area of expertise, but how do we leverage new technologies to close the loop with voters on what we did after the election? Unfortunately, the reality is while you may be steeped in it every day, the vast majority of people who just voted will not be reached about what government did. Other than a few things about the federal government and the, and the national media, particularly at a local level, very few of us will really understand what tough decisions were made, where was money spent, what impact did it have. We've got to find better ways to close the loop and actually make a case for government. Unfortunately, it's kind of crazy that we have to do that. And maybe those of us on the West Coast who feel a little bit better about the state of our government miss this. But for most of the country, and particularly, I think, for younger people, we have to make a case for the value of government and explain to people what it does, why it matters. And that's kind of an uncomfortable thing because it's a question of do we spend taxpayer dollars to go make a case for government and explain to people what we've done. And we do that in little ways. You see a sign on the road that says here's your redevelopment dollars paving this road. But we've got to find smarter, more efficient, more impactful and compelling ways to just show people what government does and why it matters. Because that case has not been made to this generation. And, and I think it's a, it's a real gap. If I may add one thing. Um, when, when John Kennedy Jr. started George Magazine, you remember George Magazine? He, his press conference, he, he said he started the magazine because culture drives politics. Not the other way around, but culture drives politics. I think that's true. And, and uh, w whether we like it or not, Donald Trump's political success is a reflection of, of a cultural, important cultural movement in this country. Um, and to answer the vice mayor's question, you know, uh, uh, if, if our politics is contentious or coarse, it's because our culture is. And, and really, we're a reflection of what we do in, in, the, in the public space of what's happening in the, in, in the cultural world. Question in the back. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for all your all your comments. Thank you for setting this thing up. Um, I'm already fascinated. Um, you've made some excellent points, and Matt, I think your last points you just made kind of hit the mark for me. Um, civic engagement is critical. Um, we need to find ways to get people interested, and I think uh, Professor Michelson, you said you know people don't like politics and. And quite frankly, I, I abhor the word partisan um, myself. So finding the way to get people in, interested and then engaged, I think, is really something that I'm hearing that you all are, are doing, and I'm very thankful for that. The only, the only concern I've got is, good God, how many apps do we have to consider to do this? Um, um, it, what's the magic app? And, and um, and I'm a, I'm, an, I'm a dinosaur with an old phone, and good God, I can't even get some of these apps. But, you know, so, so I really want you to help figure out how to, how to bring, it, bring it together, but I'm scared of apps. Get, get, get a new phone, but don't get a Samsung Galaxy 7. <laughs> You know, there's been huge underinvestment in civic tech. I think, I think, unfortunately, for the next 10 years or more, we're going to have to invest a ton, a lot of experiments, a lot of different apps. We'll see what works, and eventually, I think they'll roll up into one or two platforms. So, wait 10 years. Okay, we have, I think, just one more minute, right? So let's let's go here. If you could ask a very concise question with maybe 10 word answers. just um, add one or two word answers. Is technology a force for good or not when it comes to our democracy? So that'll be our concluding thought and reaction to uh, both of those uh, questions, starting with Matt. Sure. I, I completely agree. I think the, the role of the individual to be educated, the role of the media we have to question, ultimately technology is a tool. And as I said before, I think it can be used for good or bad. It's about who's, who's holding it and what they're doing with it. I, I would say te technology is a force multiplier. It's neither a force for good or bad. You know, if it helps democratize fundraising, it's good in my perspective. If it allows someone to start a war on Twitter, I think it's bad. I think technology is a force for good, but it's not a straight line of progress. It's one of those crooked lines where there are some pitfalls along the way, and you should go to college. All the kids should go to college and learn how to become critical thinkers and to critically evaluate websites and know whether they're reliable or not. But unfortunately, of course, uh, not everyone goes to college. So that is a way to help is to strengthen public education and, and give more kids a path to college. And I'm, I'm a politician, so I'm going to say it's a force for good, technology is, but it starts with education. So with that, let us thank our panel, Matt Mahan, Jude Berry, and Professor Melissa Michelson. They were fantastic. Thank you all for the discussion. We have just about a 10-minute break, 10-minute break, and then we will reconvene shortly. Thank you all.
everyone, if we could have your attention. We are going to gavel back into session here. If we could have the staff uh, corral folks and have them come back in. Okay, everyone, we are going to reconvene our transportation panel, or pardon me, our uh, transportation discussion. If we could have everybody come in and take your seats. We are going to be reconvening our session now. Mario and Zach, if you could have folks start taking their seats. Okay, everyone. I have been asked to announce, this is an important announcement. For those of you who are generating garbage, any garbage that is being generated, please take it to the green wall in the back that says tray return. Don't worry, folks, I'll make this announcement a number of times. If we could have everybody take their seats. Folks, to the extent possible, if you could return your cups and water bottles and napkins and all the garbage being generated. We're asking folks to take it to tray return. It is the green wall in the very back. So any garbage that we generate here in the front section, if we could take it to the back, the green wall that says tray return. So with that, it is my honor to introduce our panel topic. So let me ask a question. How many of you in the audience have used Uber or Lyft? Quite a few. Does anybody own a Tesla? Is John Maltby still here? There he is. Does anybody own a Tesla and has used its autopilot feature? One, two, two. John, you're not on the autopilot yet. Okay. In the years ahead, I know those numbers will increase as we get more comfortable and embrace alternatives to us driving solo. One of the ways we may get out of our congestion challenges is through the technology that Lauren Isaac writes about regularly and is here to share with us. Please welcome Manager of Sustainable Transportation at WSP Parsons Brinkerhoff, Lauren Isaac. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, this was really exciting to see my name with just blogger next to it, because I actually do this professionally. Um, so I, I work for WSP Parsons Brinkerhoff. If you're not familiar with it, it's a professional and engineering consulting services firm. Um, I've spent most of my career doing consulting for transit agencies. Um, I've worked in bike share. I'm now working in ride sharing. And um, what became really striking to me when I started reading about driverless vehicles, and this was probably about two or three years ago, 
was A, how quickly they're coming, um, B, how real the technology is, C, how much it was going to impact society, over here, okay, um, and, the, and yet the biggest thing is that at that time there was very little mention of government. And, and that has definitely changed in the last few years. But um, at that time, I thought it was really interesting since most of our clients are government agencies in transportation. Um, so I applied for an internal research fellowship, and I won it. And I spent, the la I spent about a year developing a guide for how local and state government agencies can plan for driverless vehicles. And as an aside, I developed the blog. Um, and please feel free to follow it, because I, I love blogging about this. But um, I do consult with agencies around the country and actually around the world on how they can plan for driverless vehicles. So, to start, um, I like to just define what we're talking about. So driverless vehicles, also called automated or autonomous vehicles or self-driving vehicles, um, it's, it's where a vehicle where the driver is intended to provide destination or navigation input, but they're not expected to be available for control at any time during the trip. Um, this means that the driver can literally be sleeping. Um, it really presents incredible opportunities in ter terms of changing the design of the vehicles, changing how we get around, how we use our vehicles, how we think of mobility. Um, but thinking about it through the lens of government, it pre presents really incredible opportunities for our safety. Um, right now, um, the estimates show that more than 90% of accidents that happen on our roadway are due to human error. So think distracted driving, drunk driving, speeding, that's over 90%. So in theory, if you are able to eliminate the driver, the human, from the equation, we would have the ability to um, bring accidents down by over 90%. So that's huge from what government goals perspectives are. The second piece is mobility. Um, the ability to get elderly, disabled, and youth to be able to get around more easily um, is a great benefit. So, um, so then the question is, um, why aren't they here now? I and mean, we, we in the Bay Area actually have had the benefit of seeing them. Have many of you seen them on the roads of the Bay Area? Yeah. Um, I give this talk all over the place, and usually I'm explaining that they really are out there, and, and you have to believe me, they really are there. But, um, but you know, right now, most automaker, most car companies and technology developers are stating that they, these vehicles will be publicly available, fully automated driverless vehicles will be publicly available in the 2018 to 2022 timeframe. Um, the only exception I've heard of so far is Porsche because Porsche drivers apparently want to have their vehicles. That's how Porsche feels about it. But um, that, that being said, it's very interesting to see forecasts of when we'll actually see a proliferation of the vehicles. Um, well, I've seen some forecasts that say that we're going to have 100% driverless vehicle penetration in our society by 2026, 10 years. I think that's pretty aggressive and, and probably too aggressive, um, especially since the average age of our vehicles is 11 years. I don't think people are going to turn over that quickly. Um, that being said, when you look at smartphone adoption, as we heard earlier, it's kind of incredible how quickly we adapt to technology. So um, I would say that most forecasts I've seen estimate around 30 to 40 percent adoption in the 2030 time frame, but it's yet to be seen. So, so why don't we have the vehicles here today? There are actually quite a few barriers to adoption right now. Um, the one big one is obviously the technology, just the readiness of it. Um, the question is how, how ready, how, how do we know when the technology is ready? And that's something that actually the government is struggling with, how to actually regulate that. Uh, the federal government just came out with draft policy guidelines about a month ago, um, and it was huge literally around the world in this industry because the U.S. government really kind of came out ahead and it included it in a 15-point safety checklist to outline what might stipulate when a driverless vehicle is ready. Um, but another piece of this is human acceptance. Will people be willing to get into the vehicles? So I'll ask all of you, if you could get into a driverless vehicle right now, parked right outside a box, would you do it? Yeah, that's, this is the Bay Area audience I know and love. I've given this talk in Connecticut. I had one person out of 200 raise their hand. <laughs> kind of amazing. But um, that, is, that is a huge issue. And I think literally if automakers had these cars available tomorrow, I don't think we would necessarily see great adoption. So um, right now the national average is well under 50% people willing to get into those vehicles. So there are quite a few other barriers. Examples include um, travel, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 
cybersecurity, um, who's going to protect the data to make sure that terrorists don't hack into it, um, who's going to protect the travel data, making sure there's data security and privacy protections, the liability question, who's liable if a driverless vehicle hits another driverless vehicle, what if that driverless vehicle hits a not driverless vehicle, it's really complicated and it's kind of throwing our insurance industry for a loop. Um, and then the last piece is the government. Uh, I shouldn't say last. There are quite a few other barriers. Those are the highlights. But um, the government and what should the government be doing? So I want to really quickly walk through a couple of scenarios of what our world could look like with all driverless vehicles. So if you can kind of put your Jetsons thinking cap on, fast forward, say, 50, 60 years, and imagine we have an entirely driverless society. So imagine I'm a mom. It's a Monday morning. I wake up get my kids ready for school, and I summon my, our private driverless vehicle from its remote parking lot um, a few miles away. And that vehicle comes, it picks up the kids, and it takes them to school. And then by the time it gets back, I'm ready to go. So I get into the vehicle, and I first get on the elliptical trainer, and I get my workout in. And then and it keeps taking me to work while I'm doing this. And then I have some coffee, and I watch the news on my TV. And then I see I should probably get started on my work day, so I start working. Um, and then eventually I do get into the office. So I'm probably sitting in traffic for most of that, but I don't really care. So then I get into the office and I realize I don't have any groceries for dinner that night. So I use my smartphone and I send the vehicle out to go get my groceries. So first I have the vehicle go to the one grocery store to get the cheapest meat. Then I have it go to another grocery store to get the cheapest vegetables. And then another grocery store to get the cheapest toilet paper. And then it knows it has no more errands, so it goes back out to the remote parking lot about 15 miles outside of the city, and it waits for its next assignment. So that's scenario one. Um, I've, I've given this talk quite a few times, and I've had quite a few people say to me, that sounds like a dream come true. It's what I've been waiting for. And it's actually what I call the nightmare scenario. It's actually very frightening if you think about with the way that we have congestion today, Imagine adding in that layer of trips and that, that many more trips. And now you're adding not just no mention of public transit in that scenario, not just single occupancy vehicle trips, but you have zero occupancy vehicle trips. It's a whole new world. So it's actually really frightening. So now I'm going to play out for you a totally different scenario. So imagine it's a Monday morning. I wake up, get my kids ready for school, and I get them onto their driverless school bus. And that driverless school bus takes them to school. And then when I'm ready to go, I use my smartphone and I summon a driverless shuttle. And that driverless shuttle shows up at my, at, at my door, picks me up, picks up a couple of my neighbors, and then it takes us to the local train station. And then I get on the train. It's timed perfectly, so I get there and I get right on. I never take out my wallet. The whole thing is paid for seamlessly through my phone. And I get downtown. And then when I get downtown, I hop on a bike share bike and I go that last mile and I get into my office. So then when I'm in the office, I realize I don't have groceries for dinner that night. So I pull out my phone and I schedule a grocery delivery for that evening for when I'm home. So that second scenario, I call that the utopian scenario. Um, it's, these are obviously very extreme, but the real difference between those two scenarios is the level of vehicle and ride sharing that's happening. And I am the first to tell you I know that our reality is going to be somewhere in the middle. It's not going to be that extreme. But, and that being said, I've had quite a few people say, I think the nightmare scenario is actually just an extension of today's use of vehicles. So that is something to think about. But I would, I would lay, I would purport to you that it's actually going to be the government that influences where on that spectrum that we fall. It's going to be good government policy and investment that's going to influence how we use vehicles. So think about level of ride sharing. I mean, having something like, um, how do we, how do we, sorry, how do we, met, how do we, um, impact, the vehicle miles traveled impact, could be with things like road user charging or high occupancy vehicle lanes. We need people to actually feel the impacts when they make the decisions to use their vehicles that much. Another example will be um, putting in good policies and land use policies so that we reduce urban sprawl so people don't choose to live far farther from where they work so they have really long commutes. Um, influencing how much we charge for parking and how much we charge sales tax for purchasing vehicles so we reduce people's desire to own vehicles and to put more, uh, to park their vehicles downtown. So all of this said, it really shows the very, very important role of local and state governments, which I think is often overlooked in the media. Um, but I think it's very important. So with that, I will turn it over for questions. Um, and please feel free on the app. I know it has Twitter, LinkedIn, the blog, everything you could want to know about me in there. So um, thank you so much, and please ask any questions.
you know, we're, we're a little bit behind schedule. Let's give Lauren another round of applause. Thank you so much. If you have questions for Lauren, she will be here for a little while, so please uh, connect with her one-on-one. -on -one. So um, as you've already heard this morning, uh, we are fortunate to live in a community, San Mateo County, that values education. Time and time again, voters up and down the peninsula and throughout San Mateo County have been asked to support bonds and parcel taxes to help our public schools, and they have replied, for the most part, with a yes. Education foundations raise money for our schools. Businesses, large and small, offer support. And as you will learn from our next panel, which is uh, getting ready to assemble, two of our largest employers are making significant investments that are setting the standard for corporate support and in the process disrupting concepts of philanthropy and shifting how and what students are taught. Roseanne Faust, President and CEO of Sam Cedar, will lead the conversation. And I just want to give a personal Major thank you to Roseanne and Sam Sita, who do all sorts of work behind the scenes uh, that make today possible. So thank you so much, Roseanne. Let me turn it over to Roseanne Faust and Sam Sita, who will be moderating our panel. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Warren, because it's really their vision that has made Connect for the last four years happen. So we have two fabulous speakers. If you have not downloaded the app, I'm going to really encourage you to do it because their bios are on there. They're fantastic, and you can figure out which one likes to ride horses and which one likes to fly planes. So it's a challenge for you. And it could be the same person, just, just saying. So we are going, Ragnar is going to start. Great. And I'm just going to, I'm actually going to step down here while you two are talking. No, no, that's perfect. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity here. Last night, I was, um, I could not sleep because I was so excited. So if I do fall off of this chair, you'll know why. Um, but my name is Ragnar von Schieber. I'm from Genentech. Um, and I will jump in here today. We're going to be talking about Future Lab, which is Genentech's commitment to science education in the South San Francisco Unified School District. And a little bit about Genentech. So we were founded 40 years ago. Um, we are credited with founding the biotech industry. Um, we are located in South San Francisco with about 9,000 of our total 14,000 employees uh, at that site. And we're really about the discovery and the development and the bringing to market of medicines um, for gnarly uh, diseases that are out there. And we have about 35 different medications right now on the market. So. Press the wrong button here. Um, so what I want to talk about is that science. And our science is what really drives our business. And our love for science is what I'd really like to talk about today as we are sharing that love of science with South San Francisco Unified School District uh, as part of Future Lab. Two years ago, we embarked on a pretty amazing journey with the school district. Um, and I could, I'm one of three people really in this room. Um, two of the folks from South San Francisco Unified could also do this presentation. And it's so exciting to see that the collaboration between um, the public sector and, the, the, and education and corporations working together so closely. So Future Lab goals, what we're looking to do is bring science alive for science, for, for students K through 12 in the public school system of South San Francisco Unified. You know, we're looking to share that science in our backyard, right where we are, with the district that's there. It's a district that's great. You know, education is really important, but there are some challenges to South San Francisco um, uh, district. Um, and we really want to share that, uh, share biotech with the next generation, so that the next generation of innovators and scientists will be coming to work at Genentech. We're really about those career paths. We're committed to making those career paths happen for local youth. 
Um, and diversity in STEM is a vital, um, uh, of vital importance for us as we get more brains, different brains, different perspectives, thinking to help solve big problems out there. And finally, employees, and this is the big piece here for me, is engaging those employees in doing great stuff and really loving the company that they're working for. So a couple of tenants for Future Lab. One is hyperlocal, and we talk about this um, as a key tenant for Future Lab. Our partnership with one school district, one public school district, I think is quite unique. Um, it is something that we haven't seen uh, uh, yet and something that we're really excited to be championing. Um, Hands-on STEM. We know that kids are excited to learn. They're excited to learn when the content is exciting and when they're able to engage in that content, right? We're also really looking at um, Hands-on STEM as a way to activate and engage students of all levels, those are just who are succeeding and those who are not succeeding, because that's really important to turn those kids around and to keep the kids who are engaged, continue to have them be engaged. The third piece of our puzzle really is around mentoring and the value that it brings on both sides of the equation. For kids, and especially the kids that we're working with, it's a real opportunity for them to visualize themselves in potential roles and as potential future adults and, and workers. Uh, it's also a, a, an amazing opportunity for our employees to give back and to really see the impact one-on-one -on -one with the students that they are helping. So uh, important on both sides of the equation. Um, and then finally, the fourth factor is, you know, Future Lab was built in South San Francisco, for South San Francisco, by South San Francisco Unified School District and Genentech, right? And this is the key, the key piece here is really the listening ear, the collaboration that we have been able to achieve together with the district. So what is Future Lab? Um, I'm gonna just showcase a couple of the signature programs that we have, which are really K through 12, STEM education, age appropriate science, hands on. Um, in elementary school, we look at Gene Academy, and Gene Academy is our on site mentoring program. It's getting kids excited about science, right? Um, so that they come wide eyed and, and eager. Uh, we know that kids are coming to, they're, they're not missing Mondays at their school, right? Because they know on Mondays they're going to Gene Academy afterwards. It's an after school program. Um, Helix Cup is our middle school flavor of, of program. And this is where kids are learning that they can do science. It's about engaging students in science. And this is the time, eighth grade, 50% of all kids lose interest in science in eighth grade, right? So this is an eighth grade science competition, not for the best and brightest, but for every student in South San Francisco Unified School District. And then the third piece of our, uh, the third major signature program that we have as part of Future Lab is Science Garage. And this is really where we expose students to the opportunities of science and the potential of how they might work in science. It's about uh, a biotech curriculum that we are working with, um, the district, a four year biotech curriculum, uh, and also a science garage, which is a state of the art teaching facility where biotech will be taught within the school district. Um, I want to give you just a quick flavor of each of those three components here. Gene Academy is, is a pretty magical thing. Uh, we, have 200, we have 200 kids, third through fifth grade, uh, mostly English language learners, about 60%, uh, mostly Latino, about 80%, uh, coming on campus every Monday in school buses, they arrive with their backpacks, which are way too big for them. Um, and they come and fill to capacity our two major cafeterias. We have 400 employees who on a weekly basis are going to those cafeterias and meeting one-on-one -on -one with the same students, two-on-one, -on -one, I should say, with the same students, doing, uh, alternating between everyday homework help, math and English, and science, fun science, engaging science experiments, which are, are part of shock and awe and excitement, where you've you got fire extinguishers or dry ice or things like that, bottle rockets. Um, and this is a place where, you know, a lot of these kids don't have um, 
one-on-one -on -one time with an adult. You know, a lot of their parents are, 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 are immigrant families, you know, who are working two to three jobs, and this is a really valuable time that, where they're having not just one but two uh, employees and, and uh, adults really looking to them and, and seeing how they can help them, teach them, also mentor them, and just be a friend for them. Helix Cup, a science competition, right? Everyone has, many companies have science competitions for the best and the brightest, right? This is a competition for every student. And it's not just a science competition that is really uh, moving the muscles of science. It's really about teamwork. It's about collaboration. It's about communication, right? Students are in teams of three or four. Uh, and together they sign, they do design challenges, and there's four of those design challenges um, that span the entire um, second semester for students. Um, every eighth grader is participating, and we've got, this year we're going to have about 200 volunteer coaches who go to the classrooms and are there coaching the students. Why are you doing that? What, what do you think is going to happen if you do this? What's, what's, your, uh, what's your idea for how to solve the problem that you're seeing right now? This is about failure. This is about trial and error. This is about persistence and resilience and grit and all of those things that we know our education system should be uh, building the muscles of our students for. Um, uh, it's also about shock and awe. It's about uh, uh, meaningful and magnetic experiences. How many of you guys have done an egg drop previously, right? Sure, right? How many of you have done it from an industrial scissor lift, like 40 feet in the air, you know, and have your principal drop, you know, your, uh, your uh, egg? Um, this is really about, you know, kids getting excited about, wow, forgetting themselves and really, you know, using all of their brain and all of their, their um, skills to solve challenges. Some feedback from last year that I think is really fun to see. 51% of students, and we've got lots of data, but I'm just showcasing this around this one particular program that we've got. Uh, 51 students thought, 51% thought, uh, science was cooler, right? Because we know in eighth grade, coolness is the most important thing, right? 100% um, of teachers thought that, that um, teamwork and collaboration and skills like that, the four C's were really increased. 47% um, of students gained interest in a job in science, right? Ninth grade, only 9% of kids will choose a science degree moving forward. So this is, again, a place to really move the needle. 98% um, uh, of coaches said they would coach again. Uh, lower left, I'm not sure if this was more fun for me or the student, but it was a blast, right? So that's where an employee is really saying, wow, this is meaningful and magnetic, not just for the kids, but also for me, and I want to do it again and again. Uh, and then on the, on the right, Helix Cup was the best thing we've done the entire school year. Can't we just do more of this, right? So fun stuff. What's next? Science Garage is up and coming. We are now building. This is a photo hard to see, but this is a photo um, of Science Garage, which is a state-of-the-art teaching facility that um, Genentech is building. Uh, $7.8 million donation that we are building on the grounds of South San Francisco High School. We will be turning that over to the school district. Um, we are together creating, a, like I said, a four-year curriculum on biotechnology. Right now we have about 800 kids who are taking this in the pilot year. Um, about 650 are doing that as part of a four-week a four curriculum embedded within bio, biology. Every student is taking that. And about 180 kids are taking biotech one and two, which is a full-year class, as we develop three and four. And then in senior year, capstone projects are going to be done which maybe will be including internships as well. So, um, uh, and by next year, when this Science Garage opens, we're going to have over 1,000 students are going to be taking some flavor of biotech within South San Francisco Unified. This year, we're going to be piloting our new volunteer program that's going to be going into Science Garage. We'll probably do about 30 or 40 employees will be helping out, and we'll be scaling that in 2017. So super exciting. Um, some other future lab highlights, just really quickly. Um, I told you about three of the signature programs, but there's also other uh, programs and activities that we do to support schools, teachers, and students, and that's Donors Choose. Every teacher within the school district gets a $500 annual 
um, grant from Genentech. Uh, professional development is paid for by um, Genentech for science teachers in middle school and high school. All field trips for science classrooms in middle school and high school. Uh, and we're also bringing about 100 volunteer chaperones to go with the students there. Um, two scholarships for 50000 per uh, for four years go to um, two of the students from every year to the high schools. And then we have over 1,300 volunteers per year giving about 25,000 hours across these many and varied programs. And, you know, the success factors, again, I can't belabor this more. It's really the partnership with South San Francisco Unified where we have co-designed this, we have built, helped build the capacity of the district so that there's a teacher on special assignment who is able to support a lot of the programming that's going into this. We've um, created an incredible listening and collaborative uh, approach, continuously learning. We meet on all levels of the district, on, across all of our projects on a continuous and on a constant basis. Um, and we've really come together to, we are coming together to, to create shared outcomes and, uh, and, and what we're really uh, looking to accomplish here. So, and I think that is it. I don't have time necessarily, one minute and a half, can I do it? All right, this is a pro, this is, you'll see. My name is Stephanie Romero and this is El Camino High School. I'm Kelsey Woods and I go to South San Francisco High School. And we're going to be job shouting at Genentech. <laughs> the campus is beautiful, I've seen it. I know that they have a DNA shaped road when you look at it from above. We bring kids from South San Francisco high schools to come here to Genentech to learn about what life is like here at Genentech. So they walk in, they sign up, of course, it wouldn't be a Genentech event without t-shirts and some swag. The primary focus of what we do here is to get these kids to participate in what we call career encounters. So we have eight functions. The kids will actually rotate through at least three of them and they get to get some hands-on experience of what life is like in those functions. We hope that it's a real engaging day for the students. I was excited, but I never thought I would be this this hands-on. As you can see, I'm like dressed in the lab coat. It's pretty fun. It's really eye-opening. I found out that my interest in sociology and psychology might actually really benefit me here. When I was coming in, I really didn't know what to expect. I don't know what I thought it was going to be like, but I'm so excited I came here. It was a really good experience. Like, I didn't think I'd take this much away. Learning like all the different fields that there are today. I'm more ready to go into the job field. The facility is amazing. The people are so giving and it, it was just a great environment to be in. So the takeaway is kind of like, maybe I do have a job opportunity here. They really want to help people and like I want to be able to help people the way everyone here does. If I could come here every day, I would. As a company, we're so proud to be able to give back to the community and really to um, be able to support the schools and to support the next generation, hopefully, of scientists that will find a cure for cancer. Great job, Analytical Team. Good job. Thank you, Ragnar and Genentech. Super cool. So we are now going to have Colleen Cassidy from Oracle. So super cool. Loved hearing about what Genentech is doing. Um, and there's so many commonalities in terms of what we're doing. Let me see if I can make friends with this clicker here. Oops. Whoa. Uh -oh. My name is Stephanie Romero. There we go. OK. So my name is Colleen Cassidy. I'm the executive director of the Oracle Education Foundation. And I also oversee philanthropy more generally for Oracle. And I want to do a few things here today. So first, um, I'm going to share with you a video that talks about a really special public-private partnership that we've embarked upon over the last couple of years, including the Oracle Education Foundation, Oracle itself, the enterprise, Design Tech High School, two school two school districts, San Mateo and Sequoia Union High School districts, the San Mateo County Office of Education, Redwood City, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. 
I'm going to share a video with you about that. And then I'm going to zoom out a little bit to talk about Oracle's philanthropy globally to give you some context, and then spend the last few minutes talking about this public-private partnership in depth. So let's start with the video. Today is about celebrating the groundbreaking for Design Tech High School's new home at Oracle. Today is going to make it real. We're going to be with shovels, we're going to be breaking ground, and everybody's just really excited. The students, the parents, and faculty and staff of the school collaborated with Oracle and its architects, DES engineers, to design this school. It's a first for a public school to be located on a corporate campus, so it's kind of a momentous day. So not only will we be located here and have a great facility, but we'll have easy access to Oracle employees that can, if a student's stuck on some computer coding problem, they could email an Oracle volunteer and say, hey, could you help me with this? I say, oh yeah, at 2.30, I'll be over to help. They will be creating, they will be making, they will be shaping, so their education, their learning won't be this abstract thing, it'll be applied. They'll really be solving problems that that matter to them. They had a part in actually designing their own school and they worked with Oracle employees and top people in the design field to do that. They're not going to be intimidated the first time they step into a workplace. This is an extraordinary public-private partnership and in a lot of ways I think it really represents the best of the Silicon Valley community. This is an example of positive disruption in education. Just being in the new school is just thinking about it it's amazing because we have this whole new environment that's supports us and supports our learning and that's just so important in today's new world. Our mission is to develop students who believe the world can be a better place and that they can be the ones to make it happen. Oracle's building a school for DTech on its campus. No one would have predicted this in 2013 uh, when Nicole and I were first gathering signatures for our petition, but here we are. As one parent told me, this was too big of a dream to even dream. I asked Safra, why was Oracle doing this? And she replied simply, because it's the right thing to do and because we can. She loved the program and she loved the school. She pointed down to this very piece of land and said, I'm pretty sure we own that. We could build a school there. It was a moment when I stopped and thought to myself, something very, very special is, is happening right now. To build a school that is sustainable, LEED certified, designed for a specific use. We make this available to this community and we give this wonderful opportunity for Oracle employees to mentor and help guide students, the class that actually helped design the school are going to be able to actually go here. The building is a physical embodiment of Design Tech's mission. It will be a living extension of Design Tech, and it will be able to inspire new generations of students for many years to come. It is not only on its way to being the best high school in the country, but the best high school in the world. And I truly believe that this new school that Oracle is building us is taking us 100 steps closer to that goal. Huh. All right, so now we're going to zoom out. All of Oracle's philanthropy focuses in three key areas. That is education, environment, and community. And this is globally. Oracle volunteers help to execute on that philanthropy by initiating volunteer projects with nonprofit and non-governmental organizations around the world. And about 90% of those Oracle volunteer projects are initiated by employees. This fine-looking group of folks who are a little scruffy and dirty looking are, are sitting on top of an eight-foot high pile of ice plant, which is an invasive non-native species here in California, and they just ripped it out of Rodeo Beach uh, with a nonprofit called Nature Bridge that does field science education. They are an example of more than 27,000 Oracle employees who volunteered in fiscal year 2016, working with over 500 organizations on more than 1,100 projects around the world. 
Oracle giving, again, supports those same three dimensions of work. And in FY16, we gave 16.5 million in cash. We also matched more than a million dollars in employee contributions. And we worked with 228, 228 nonprofits and NGOs in 15 countries on programs that were both local and global education and environment programs. Here in the Bay Area, this is what it looks like. And hopefully you see some of your favorites on that list, including Sam Sita, our host here today. Finally, the Oracle Academy is our in-kind donation program. We advance computer science education through the Academy by donating Oracle software and curriculum, mostly to higher education institutions, colleges, and universities. The annual value of that is in excess of $3.5 billion a year. And that includes the discount, by the way. Um, it touches more than 3 million students in 110 countries. So that's the high level. And now I want to spend the next few minutes talking about the Oracle Education Foundation in a way that is pretty hyper-local at this point. The Oracle Education Foundation is a nonprofit organization funded by Oracle. It was founded in 2000, and I joined Oracle to start the foundation. What I can tell you is that the mission of the foundation has been very consistent throughout those 16 years, focused on digital inclusion and helping students develop technological fluency. That said, the way that we deliver on that mission has morphed three times, most recently in the spring of 2014, when we decided to develop a new mission program. We have a long relationship with Stanford University and with the D School at Stanford. How many of you know the D School at Stanford? the Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, right? Where design thinking was codified into a notion that hopefully a lot of us are familiar with now. And so as design thinkers, we approached developing our new program as a design thinking exercise. So that meant we started doing empathy work with our users. And we knew one group of users right off the bat because our CEO, Safra Katz, said, I want our employees involved in students' educational experience. We have amazing people, and I want them to be part of this new program. That was her only requirement. We also knew that high school was a sweet spot for us. So what we did is gathered 50 people for eight hours for a program design challenge. That was Oracle employees, it was representatives of nine Bay Area high schools, and some nonprofit best practitioners working in STEM and STEAM. And we, we worked with them to really uncover their needs. We pushed past our assumptions about what those needs were or what the solutions were to find bolder ideas. And we had them help us rapidly prototype elements of a potential new mission program so that we could understand what really mattered to them, what they really cared about. And among the things that they really care about are authenticity in their students' educational experience. Technical acumen, and this is not just fluency with using existing devices and software. This is the ability to use technology to create new solutions, even create new technology. Empathy, because the one thing technology cannot do is empathize with you. And if you're talking about creating solutions to problems, people are involved in problems. You need to be able to understand their perspective and their feelings, put yourself in their shoes. Grit. We share the, the common respect for grit. Students need to learn to persevere through difficulty and even failure and understand it as part of the path to success. It is something that is inevitable and even necessary if you're going to create something that has never existed before. So the much vaunted innovation that we all talk about all the time. Creative confidence. Creativity is not the domain of creative types. Any one of us can be creative and can be an innovator. And all of those abilities are what we aim to deliver on through the Oracle Education Foundation and the new program that it's been piloting with Design Tech High School um, for just going on three years now. We've just begun our third year. So we engage Oracle employees as volunteer coaches working with students, guiding them through multi-day, really immersive experiences at the intersection of STEAM disciplines and design thinking. Students learned code, they learned electrical engineering, 
electronics, they learn project management and human-centered design, and most importantly, they learn this from real practitioners. Students apply these skills to design challenges in a variety of domains, including wearable technology, Internet of Things, data visualization, and more. And we've begun piloting this program here very locally with Design Tech High School. So we plan to extend and scale this program to other Oracle communities in the future. But for the first few years, we're working exclusively with Design Tech High School. And you might remember that program development workshop that I talked about, the nine schools represented. Among those participants were four founding members of Design Tech High School's faculty. They were extraordinary. And so was their model, a complete reinvention of high school. So as the name Design Tech implies, design thinking is part of the school's core curriculum. In addition, the school is modeled on two key concepts, which are extreme personalization and teaching students to put their knowledge into action. One of the primary ways that the school personalizes the student experience is through its intercession program. Lots of schools have intercessions. They look different in different places. At DTEC, what this means is that four times a year, the entire school hits the pause button on its core curriculum so that students can take electives uh, about which they are curious or passionate. And these electives are provided by the community, most of them, in their studios, in their offices, in their workshops. And this is obviously a perfect place for the Oracle Education Foundation's program to slot in. So when we propose to Safra Katz, piloting the program with Design Tech High School and co-developing it with them, she was very excited. She thought it was a great idea, and she loved the model of the school. It all adds up to one of the most promising educational models we've seen anywhere in the world, and we've seen a lot. The thing that DTEC lacked was a home. So the San Mateo Union High School District chartered DTEC unanimously. They've been hugely supportive. What they didn't have was a facility that would really enable Design Tech High School to fulfill its full potential and evolve. As you heard in the video, we were able to provide a home. It's the right thing to do, and we can. So we are building a state-of-the-art bespoke facility that was co-designed by the founding class of students, some of their parents, DTEC educators, our architects and engineers, and Oracle, to be precisely the home that they need including maximum flexibility for all the unforeseen ways in which we know the school will evolve. When Design Tech High School comes to the Oracle campus with 550 students and 30 staff in the 2017-2018 school year, it will be the only public high school in the United States located on a tech company's campus while remaining completely autonomous. And you can see this is the southern view this is this grand heroic entrance with a view corridor all the way through to Foster City. And on the left, a two-story makerspace called the Design Realization Garage that's really the heart of the school. This is the view on the Belmont Slough side, and this across the water, seeing the whole context there. What all of this adds up to is a rather extraordinary public-private partnership that includes not only the entities whose logos are on this screen. So the two school districts who had to work collaboratively to agree on preferences and did that in a way that I think is completely unprecedented. Um, Oracle the Enterprise, the Oracle Education Foundation, Design Tech High School, two nonprofits, again, San Mateo County Office of Education, Redwood City, the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission who needed to approve water, waterfront development, all working in unison in a way that's highly strategic that leverages the core competencies of each of us toward a much greater good. Thank you. So it's now time to open it up for Q&A, but I want to ask a couple questions first. Before both Ragnar and Colleen's presentation, how many in the room had a little bit of knowledge about what Genentech and Oracle has done in terms of education. How many of you had really virtually none that you weren't aware of what they were doing? Part of the goal of Connect, and frankly, one of the major roles of SAMCETA as an organization, is really to connect the greater community with what business is contributing 
besides employees, traffic, and housing problems. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. What you see from these two companies, these are Fortune 500, they are two of our major employers in San Mateo County, and each of them in their own way said, they answered the question that I was going to ask, which is why do you do it? Because it's the right thing to do. Very simple. It's not complicated. They care about our kids, they care about education, and they have really put themselves out there. So my challenge to everyone in this room is when you're in a conversation with your friends and neighbors and it talks about all the traffic, all the issues where we don't have enough housing, kind of the, the, the quality of life, can you please just bring up these two examples? Because I think they go a long way to explaining a whole other level of the business community and one that I'm not sure anyone in this room could not be proud of. So that's my ask to you, and I see people nodding their heads, and I very much appreciate it. We'd like, we have time for Q&A. They, I was sitting over to the side, and I had to sit over to the side because I get so excited about both these presentations. I've seen them before. I was at the groundbreaking for Science Garage and DTEC. These two individuals are probably two of my absolutely favorite people in the world, and I just was starting to shake. Um, so I figured it was best if I sat over there. So we have time for Q&A. We're going to pass the mics around so we can make sure that we hear people. Please go ahead and ask your questions. This is usually not a shy crowd. There has to be someone, other than the fact that you're tweeting this information out or Facebooking it. Elisa McAvoy. Other school board members, and we would certainly welcome for any of businesses that are in the room, any corporations. We would, I, any one of us would welcome the kind of relationship that uh, Gen and Tech and Oracle have put together for uh, individual school districts and schools. So thank you very much. And I'm just curious, like, what kind of conversations do you have with your peers in business? Sure, I'll go first. Um, so. The culture at Genentech really is first, let's do something, um, and let's actually see how that goes, and, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Um, we're not of the flavor that we make big proclamations of what we will do, and then um, we're really on the back end. We're far slower at that than we perhaps should be. I think our plan is really to become I think the an inspiration to other corporations and to other school districts, and you know, we we just won a an award from U.S. 2020 uh, STEM Mentoring Award, which really recognized, you know, the the private public partnership that we have going with the district, and you know, as part of our future work, we're really going to be showcasing that. That's what this event is, you know, and, and others, um, both in the Bay Area as well as nationally. So, um, and, and we'd like to figure out ways to further enable other companies to do this hyper-local approach beyond just the inspiration piece of like, hey, they did it, why can't we? We will, right? Which it, it is quite that simple in some, in some ways. And for the Oracle part of things, I can say that uh, last year at Oracle Open World, which is our flagship technology conference up in San Francisco, it attracts more than 60,000 people a year. Safra Katz did a big reveal about this project, and she essentially, in a very polite way, threw down the gauntlet to Oracle customers and partners and said, folks, we are not just talking the talk, we are walking the walk with tens of millions of dollars invested in this facility and thousands of hours of our people's time. 
Oracle employees can volunteer up to 104 hours a year for the Oracle Education Foundation without any impact on their vacation or leave, and they have the blessing and the encouragement from the highest office in the company to do that. So we have been talking about it, and then um, we also talk very actively with members of the educational community here locally and in other parts of the world where we live and work and do business about the best projects and programs to invest in and we do that longitudinally. So if we start funding a program and it's solid and growing and um, innovating, we tend to, to continue funding for a long time. There's nothing whimsical about our philanthropic investments. Another question? Thank you for your presentation and your great work. Um, in the case of um, Genentech, for example, um, when you work with um, a, a, with um, a education um, entities um, or administrators, do you bring uh, a specific um, a goals uh, or are they open um, to expand um, their, uh, you know, the the uh, the curriculum, or how how did it work in your experience? Yeah, uh, you know, we bring a lot of humbleness when we come to education because that's not our business, right? Our business is is science and health outcomes, um, and so we really look to education and to our, our partners to really. You know, what's the, that's the expertise that they bring, right? Um, together, um, we, are, we are coming up with the shared outcomes, which are going to be guiding both sides of the equation. I think we have a lot of common ground there with the district. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're both very geared towards, you know, let's get more kids you know, graduating, let's get more kids college ready, let's get more kids going to college, get more kids excited about STEM, um, and passionate, finding their own particular passions, whether it's in STEM or not in STEM, right? So, um, again, it's, it's, a, it's with that humbleness that we come and we, we follow, uh, though, uh, we're also a, a very engaged partner in, in that determination of what are those goals we're, we're looking to, to go after. So our panel has come to a close because we're trying to keep it on time. So please thank Colleen and Ragnar. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, I'm not going up on stage again. All right, now I'm really excited about this presentation. And uh, it was about a month ago that the San Francisco Chronicle, and on my staff I have a foodie, Carol Marks, who discovered this article and brought it to our attention um, for Connect. But the story ran in the Sunday food section about uh, impossible foods. And it's meatless patty. And we wanted to, uh, we actually talked to Impossible Foods about serving you meatless patties for lunch today. Um, but we just couldn't work out the logistics, so just keep that in mind that uh, it's a meatless patty, it's a disruptive food. In any case, in the article, the company founder, Patrick Brown, explained that the idea originated during a sabbatical he took uh, from Stanford uh, University. Um, as a biochemistry professor, and uh, he took that sabbatical about six years ago, he set a personal goal, which was chase solutions to the most important problem in the world. He said, quote, I decided that the problem was the use of animals as a food technology, and that technology is by far the greatest threat uh, to the global environment. So here to tell us more 
Now, they have, they've been all over the media. How many of you have heard, read stories on Impossible Foods in the media or heard it on the news? Yeah, not a whole lot. But anyway, uh, hey, hey, come on over well, now, here. Now you'll hear it. <laughs> now we're going to hear all about it, but we're really thrilled to have uh, Impossible Foods st Chief Strategy Officer uh, Nick Halla with us today. Would you please give him a, a, a Redwood City welcome? <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You might want to stage. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you for the nice introduction. And it's uh, exciting to be here in Redwood City, which is our home turf. We're just a couple miles down the road. And so we've been uh, here in Redwood City for almost four years now. So I'm going to tell you a little more about what we're doing in Impossible. And that was a great introduction of what we've kind of just a high level grounding. But uh, I'll start out with a question, which I guess you already answered. But what is the biggest environmental threat to the world today? And it is animal farming, the way we use animals to produce food. A lot of people talk about the way we do transportation and moving to electric vehicles or autonom autonomous. Like that can take a lot of the impact of that system out, but I'll go through some statistics later. A lot of people talk about our energy production. But environmentally, if you look across the board, it's animal farming. In my background, that's the world I came from. I grew up on a small family farm in Minnesota, a uh, dairy farm, and saw the production from the from the ground. And at a small point source, you don't really see the impact nearly as much, but from a global perspective, it's huge. And then I worked at General Mills designing manufacturing systems and new products and could see how we could actually deliver food to billions of people across the world. But in those industries, very few people are ever really talking about what the actual impact was of these systems worldwide. So for animal farming today, a couple of statistics to remember is if you look at all the global livestock, the production covers 30% of the world's arable land surface not covered by ice. That's the size of North America and South America combined, just to raise animals. And if you include grazing, it's 50%. 50% of all the land is used to raise animals for food for us. Uh, from greenhouse gas emissions, it's more greenhouse gas emissions than all transportation. Uses a quarter of the water supply. And the craziest statistic is species. So right now, there are 16 times more biomass of cattle than all, all living wild mammals left on Earth. 16 times. We're just squeezing everything else out just to produce food for us. And the worst part about this is the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization predicts that the consumption is going to increase by 70% by 2050 as population rises and middle classes want more rich foods like this. So how are we going to do this? And that's where Dr. Pat Brown took a sabbatical looking at, as a biochemist, can we do this? Are there ways we can create better solutions? And it's relatively simple. If you look at a cow, for every 33 calories a cow takes in, for every 33 grams of protein, we get one calorie and one gram of protein out. So as a technology, a cow is great at producing products that people love, but it's very inefficient. And if we go to the primary source, we go to the animal, go to the plant bases that they consume right away, we can pull the nutrients out of that system to recreate, a, recreate the products directly from plants with a small, tiny fraction of the impact that we have on the environment today. So when we started, it was an idea. And there's very few ideas in Silicon Valley that can actually have worldwide big changes really to global ecosystems, and this is one of them. Uh, the way we approach the problem is first we have to understand why does everybody out here love a juicy steak or mozzarella on your pizza? And when we understood the fundamental properties of what was driving that, then we'd go in the plant-based world and individually pick out the pieces that we need to recreate that. And I'll go through an example. If you look at flavor of meat, the flavor of meat when you put a burger on the grill isn't like you're smelling meat flavor. You're smelling hundreds and hundreds of different compounds that your brain will perceive as meat. So we need to understand what was driving that, what's causing that chemistry to happen as you cook. And it turns out it's very simple. There's one protein that drives all the flavor of meat, and it's a protein called heme. So heme is a protein that's in really a basic building block of all life. In us, it's in hemoglobin, in animal tissue and muscle, it's myoglobin. In plants and for like legumes, there's a protein called leg hemoglobin, and the heme is the same. We learned it's a great catalyst to create all that reaction, all that chemistry as you cook the same natural way as you do in beef. So in our product, we, we use leg hemoglobin, the same heme, to drive the chemistry of beef so we can replicate that product. 
Because one of the theses that we had when we first started was that the only way we're going to get mainstream consumers to switch over to a plant-based system is to deliver products that they love as much or more than meat. And so we decided a couple years in that the first product we would want to target is ground beef. It's a massive industry. It's iconic in American culture. You can do so many different products with it. And over the last few years, we've been developing that. And then we recently launched and had some press. And I'll kind of go through a little bit of that. Um, but it is a raw material. So like our ground beef today, um, our chef partners have been making anything with it. Burgers, uh, meatballs, and even tartare. We went to the Climate Change Summit in Paris to start thinking about this. Because everything at the Climate Change Summit was around transportation and energy production, nothing on food. And all the food there was actually meat and dairy products. So they're really not thinking about it. And we wanted to start that conversation. So our chef that went out there with us was like, well, we need to make something French. So let's make tartare. And so we had a, like a cocktail hour, we're serving some appetizers, and we had a French woman come, come up and say that, I have tartare twice a week, and this is the best tartare I've ever had. And that's the only way we're gonna change the system. So we recently launched in uh, four restaurants, uh, Momofuku Nishi in New York with David Chang, in San Francisco at uh, Jardinier with Tracy Desjardins, and at Coxcomb in the financial district with uh, Chris Constantino, and then also in LA at Crossroads Kitchen. And these are restaurants that are known for great food and great experiences, and they won't put something on their menu that they didn't believe was great food. And Chris, for instance, he is known as the meat guy of San Francisco, and this is a new type of meat. Cows make meat from plants, we make meat from plants just directly. Um, and we're just getting started. So our team is in Redwood City. We have about 130 people, still mostly on the science, engineering, development, looking at how can we create simple solutions from the plant-based world to do this. And we have a whole suite of products from the platform coming behind. Now that we're unlocking the tools to make ground beef, we can make steak, fish, chicken, cheese. And as over time, it's like this is the only way we're really going to be able to feed the world effectively today and in 2050. So if there's Three things that I want to leave you with. One is this is a huge issue and it's very urgent that we have to solve it now. Two is the solutions are here. We, can now, we now have the abilities to make products directly from plants that are more nutritious, healthier, more cost effective, more scalable, and much, much better for the environment. And consumers are ready for it as well. And the third thing is every single choice that a consumer and you make can really have an impact. So our estimates from our externally validated life cycle analysis is that one quarter pounder that you'd replace from ground beef to us today would save a 10 minute shower's worth of water, 18 miles driving in a standard American car, and 75 square feet of land, just from one quarter pounder. So I'll, I'll open up to a couple questions. I think I have a couple minutes. All right. Yeah. Ah. So eventually, yes, not right now. So we, um, as we started looking at how what was the best way for us to go to market, we have such amazing chef partners really across the globe that want to help us deliver this message and story and help educating consumers with, the, with what we're doing and why it matters. We decided that for our brand, it's much better for us to build with the chef partners that are ready to work with us. But as we continue to scale, our intention is to be everywhere where meat is, grocery stores, direct delivery, um, fast food, restaurants across the board. All right. Yeah. So in the restaurant, oh, yep. So the question was how expensive is the product compared to meat? And so we are in four places today. So at uh, uh, Momofuku in New York, we're $12 for a burger and fries. This is in Chelsea. At Jardinier, we're $16. Uh, Coxcomb is a big, bigger, juicy, like more gourmet burger. It's 19 And I think at Crossroads, it is $16. So it's in that range. And over time, as we continue to scale, we, we believe we'll actually be much more cost effective than beef over the next several years. Yeah. Yes? Growing, how do you create the product? So the, the question was whether the technology is based on 3D printing. Uh, no, it's not. 
really the way we look at it is the fundamental building blocks that we need in the world already exist in a plant-based system. And there's a few parts that drive this. Uh, proteins are your big, our biggest scaffold, you would say, from that standpoint. You can create a lot of functions with proteins. Like from the food world I was in before at General Mills, it was like if we looked at protein, it was a nutritional category. I'm going to put 10 grams of protein into my bar, so now it's a high protein bar. But if you actually, from a biochemist perspective, like Dr. Pat Brown, every protein has different functions. So we can actually use those proteins under conditions of heating, cooling, um, just mixing even, and they'll create the tissues like mozzarella that stretch as you, as you melt it. But there's no like, like 3D printing or anything like that. It's really standard food industry equipment from that standpoint. Just better ways of how to put the materials together. Yeah. What can a group like this do to make sure that you succeed? Ooh. Um, I think we're going to need supporters across the board as we continue to scale. Um, I think spreading the word right now is the biggest thing we can do. This is such an urgent issue, um, looking at how we can actually engage the community. Because this is like meat and food is such a cultural piece of the world. The more we can actually be part of those cultural conversations and get people thinking about this, I think the faster the system will change. So any ways that we can do that. We've had a, a more and more work with the, even like the school systems, for instance, as we were just talking about education. And like the young minds of this world are very open to change, and actually they're looking for change like this. And now that we have solutions, getting people like that like intrigued and excited is really the next future leaders that we have or that are the ones who are really going to drive the change. All right. Well, thank you. If you have any questions, talk to me later. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nick. So I am very excited to bring up the gentleman standing next to me. We are thrilled to have Steve Spinner with us this morning. I said earlier that we wouldn't be reading any bios, but if you'll indulge me in this case, I'd like to touch on just a few highlights. Steve is the founder and CEO of RevUp Software, a leading data analytics software company right here in Redwood City. Steve was previously involved in angel investing and was an advisor to over 50 startups. He also has been a senior executive in a host of technology and media companies over the years. In his personal time, Steve is one of the most sought after political strategists and fundraisers in the country, having led Obama's fundraising efforts in 2008 and 2012, and most recently chairing Ro Khanna's congressional race. I first learned about Steve uh, through an article in Bloomberg News earlier this year. Let me read you just a quick paragraph. For months, some of Washington's top campaign professionals have been buzzing about a product with the potential to turbocharge political fundraising and possibly much more. The product is a piece of software, an algorithm really, that is a distilled essence of a pioneering approach to fundraising developed uh, by a few Silicon Valley entrepreneurs during Barack Obama's 2008 campaign and innovation that helped lift him to the presidency. So here to tell us more about how his disruptive fundraising, and I need to book some time with you after. Uh, let me turn it over to Mr. Steve Spinner. Steve, thank you for being here. Hi there. Thank you, everyone. Um, great. Works behind me. Uh, first, let me just start out. Uh, and hopefully this is a relatively simple question, and I'll get a quite a few hands. So who here has ever done in their entire lives any fundraising? Raise your hand. All right. Thank you. Uh, who here in the last year or two has done any type of uh, volunteer fundraising themselves? OK. Still very high. Who here in their jobs, uh, whether it be elected office, nonprofits, uh, universities, any type of higher ed, who here currently is in the field where they have to do this professionally, where they have to fundraise? Okay, still about 20, 30 percent. All right, well, um, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'll go into what we've done. Um, as the the uh, title of the, the talk is, I love fundraising. I've always loved it. Uh, it started when I was in sixth, seventh grade. Uh, there was an American Cancer Society bike-a-thon in my neighborhood in Long Island, New York. And uh, my mother allowed me to go out door to door, up and down my street, calling some friends and family uh, to do uh, a buck a mile. And my mom thought, since I had a three-speed bike and I didn't bike much, maybe I would do two, three miles and that would it would be it. 
And uh, lo and behold, we went and uh, I went to about 100 homes and, and called up people. And I went lap after lap after lap after lap. And at 14 miles, my mom finally shoved me off the bike. And I raised, you know, $1,500, uh, won the contest for the most money raised for the event. And I, all of a sudden, I got a 10-speed bike as the reward. And so here I am. I'm in sixth grade. And I'm like, this is good. I mean, I can do good, and I get a reward for this. I like how this works. Um, and I just, I, right then and there, I fell in love with uh, fundraising. Uh, after college, after I'd worked at McKinsey & Company, I wanted to do something different before I went to grad school. And for me, it was a very personal decision. I wanted to work for the Olympics in Atlanta. Uh, and I had the privilege, I had the honor of being part of the revenue organization there. I headed up, and all of 22, 23 years of age, I headed up the strategy group uh, for the Olympics uh, on their revenue side. And it was a very tall order in, in, for the 1996 games. We had to raise $1.2 billion, and we got no government funding. And on the sports sponsorship side, uh, 650 million of that had to come from our group. Well, the way the math worked at the time, you couldn't do sports sponsorships at the four or eight million dollar levels and add up to 650 unless you had a you know a hundred different sponsors, which would be terrible. And so my job, and I realized I had a talent for this. Whoops, um, a talent for this early on was that. Um, I love thinking differently, uh, and this was way before I moved to Silicon Valley. Uh, my job was to uh, take a category like telecommunications and rather than sell it to AT&T for $8 million, say, you know what, you can do long distance, you can do local, you can do equipment, you can do radio, and we made a $100 million set of sponsorships out of formerly an $8 million category. And again, now I was in love, and I was doing it to you know, help the community, help the country uh, through sport, which is something I'm also very passionate about. The problem is, after that, I fell out of fundraising. I got really serious about my career. I went to grad school. I worked at NBC in New York. Through NBC, they had me come out here. Um, I started doing a lot of startup community, uh, startups myself, uh, myself. And then after the 2004 election, uh, I, I literally had done nothing in politics before. I had voted, but that was the ex extent of my civic engagement. And I felt guilty. In a typical, naive Silicon Valley way, I thought, wow, maybe if I had uh, done something in the 2004 election, maybe John Kerry would have won. Okay? Totally naive. So I called up my friends that had been involved in politics and at a leadership level, and I said, I raised my hand. I said, what can I do to help? And they said, come to a couple of events and write some checks. So that was in February of 2005. I wrote a couple of checks, and really quickly I said, this is getting expensive. Um, what else can I do? Um, it's getting expensive. So um, they said, well, if you can't write, you raise. And I go, how do you raise? Figure it out. And there was no best practices. There were no sharing uh, of, of information, even just from friend to friend. How do you do? What do you do? What works? What doesn't work? No one did that. They just said, here's a link. Go raise money. And I said, is there any tools? Are there any technology? What, are you kidding me? Of course there's not. This is like politics. This is fundraising. We don't do that. Um, and so uh, I very quickly started doing it the old way, the traditional way, the historical way. And thankfully for me, I found out that I had this talent and passion for fundraising for politics. It was highly correlated to raising money for a company to raise money for a candidate. You had to have the same level of passion. You had to be able to stand behind something that you truly, truly believed in <laughs> I'm actually getting choked up, um, and be able to say, I need your help. I want your help. Can you give me 500? Can you give me 1,000? Can you give 2,300? Whatever. And uh, it was just something that I was, I, was, I was good at. I could spend a lot of time in it, and, um, and I very quickly started having success, being part of successful host committees, doing things at the congressional level, at the uh, senatorial level, at the gubernatorial level. Uh, but in late 2006, at the end, uh, it was November of 2006, I said, you know what, I really want to do presidential for the first time ever. And uh, I'm under the radar, no one knows about me. I'm, there's something about this guy, Barack Obama. Uh, I'd love to get involved, get involved early. I mean, it'll be a three, four month thing and we'll probably get squashed like a bug. Uh, but it's something I believed in and I jumped on board. I was one of the first 50 people to, to have j joined that organization. And, Obviously, that didn't turn out that way uh, for the betterment of the world, and he's been our, our wonderful president for the last eight years. Uh, but that was one where I started first time ever as a, as a fundraiser for a presidential campaign. And what was, I started small, did my first 50,000, did my next 100,000, did my next 250,000, 
and just kept going and going. And what was different was that I was the first person to start using social media in fundraising. Started using data to better understand my friends. It sounds pretty obvious. We should all do that. We should all be respectful of our friends, of their time, of their money. Uh, but no one had been doing that at the time. And so that allowed me, and by the way, all I'm talking about is I was looking at my LinkedIn profiles, I was calling up people, I was having conversations, I was checking out. In the conversation, I would understand, is it someone that they like to give early or did they like to give late? Is it, were there any causes that they cared about? This person cares a great deal about climate change. Keep that in the back of my head. This person really likes to attend women's events. Uh, you know, this person uh, likes to write small and then write multiple times. All those things I just used to keep in my head or on a pad. And, but that simple set of just being respectful to my friends and my network allowed me to then be one of the top fundraisers in the 2008 campaign. Uh, in 2012, uh, I had a greater leadership position and they asked me in this case to train others, to teach others to do what I did. But again, it was still without a technological solution. It was still laborious. It was still meeting with people, talking with them, asking questions, knowing what they cared about, but tailoring the ask, making it more targeted. And this all changed um, after the 2012 election. Uh, you know, when Ro Khanna decided he wanted to run, he's a dear friend of mine, and I was supportive of that race, uh, he had no staff. Any good Democrat finance person was not really allowed to work for Roe. So how could he run a competitive campaign in an extremely expensive market with no staff? And you know, he put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I helped him with that. And we just started having tons of meetings, a lot of fundraising events. But for Roe and for many of us here, um, and this is not about politics. What I'm going to talk to you about, please put on, if you're in the nonprofit space, put on your nonprofit hat. It's the same thing for you, how it can be customized. If you're in the higher ed space, it's the same thing for you. But the analogy in the demo I'm going to give you is absolutely in the political space. Um, he had to do events. He had to have supporters, whether he asked of them or they offered themselves, he needed them to raise their hand. He needed to say, I will help you. Um, I will host an event. I will co-host an event. I don't have time to do something in my home, but I'll give you 25 names. I'll give you 50 names of people for you to call. He had to figure out a way to have volunteers help him. And uh, the story that, you know, the problem with fundraising is that typically, you know, advancement staff, finance staff, they're overworked, they're underpaid, they're undertrained, and they're not given tools, at least not technical tools, similarly or not nearly as quickly as if they were in the business to business community, where data analytics is all the rage. I mean, if you work in luxury goods, they're using data analytics like crazy, and they know exactly who here is going to be willing to buy a Gucci pocketbook in the next six months. I mean, they, business communities use data analytics very, very effectively. But that had never yet gotten to nonprofits, higher ed, or political. So the best in political, if you think about it, the last time you raised for a candidate, the last time the candidate raised for him or herself, uh, the last time you got an invite to something, what was it? You typically probably got an email from someone. In most cases, it was probably a, a blast spam email to hundreds, if not thousands of people. It told a story of why you were supporting this candidate, and it gave a link. And that was it. Um, that is less than, it's 0.013% of yields. Okay, so you're, you're spamming. You're doing one level above the campaign spam blast, but it's not really targeted. But if you were to just customize that top line of an email and say, Jim, great seeing you last Thursday. I know you like to support candidates early in the cycle. Got one for you. Now your yield is going to be 15, 25, in some cases over 50% yield. That takes work. That takes time. Who has time to do that? So it's not about sending out 1,000 emails. It's sending out 25, 50, 100 targeted emails, which for me allowed me to be very successful in the Obama campaign, which for Roe, uh, allowed him to be exceedingly successful running for a congressional campaign. But again, it still was not from a technology perspective. And the light bulb for me went off when we had a, uh, a very famous venture capitalist, I don't want to embarrass him, so let's just call him Sam. Uh, Sam offered to do a fundraiser for Roe. And uh, he said, well, what's the max I can do? And the answer at the time was $5,200. Great, can my spouse give? 
Great, that's 10,400 from me. What else can you do? What else can I do uh, for you? Well, can you open up your home and, um, and uh, you know, invite some of your friends? Could we do, ideally we need a $50,000 fundraiser to meet our budget. And he said, he looked at us, he said, you know who I am. I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars for my fund. I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars for various portfolio companies. Ask me, I'll raise you a half million dollars. And we went back and forth on this because, as everyone knows, politics is different than business. Politics is different than other types of fundraising. There are caps, there's partisanship, there's sensitivities uh, between uh, who you ask and what you ask of people. Um, and, you know, this guy just basically said, look, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to raise you all this money. And this started three weeks out. With three days to go, Sam had a total of $16,000 in, in the pot. Uh, that he had raised. And he's freaking out. And he's calling his friends in South Africa, can you wire 10,000? Another company, can you do 5,000? Another person, can you do 1,000? Here, 1,000. He's sweating it. Now, Wednesday, the event comes and goes, and it's a wonderful event, and we raised $63,000, and so I'm happy, Rose happy. But Sam has aged literally 10 years in the process. I mean, he looks cr crappy for his own event. And he comes up afterwards, and he said to me, and this is from one of the best tech investors in the world, he said, I will never do this again. This was a complete waste of my time. Um, I have never been so humbled, so frustrated in any process in my life. When I send out an email, I get a response. Professionally, personally, politically, people weren't responding to me. I would have to send them a follow-up. And then they would say, really psyched that you're supporting Roe. Glad you're doing an event. Well, what does that mean? Are you going to come? Are you going to pay? Like, so he's like, I have no idea. I'm sitting there going, huh, I have no idea who of my friends care about politics. I don't know who of my friends have ever written a check to politics. I don't know who's a Dem. Oh, I could invite someone who's a Republican. I could, you know, they could be perturbed with me. Um, I don't know who's given to Roe. That's kind of a waste of time if I reach out to someone who's already maxed out. Um, oh, my God, I could reach out to someone who's given to his opponent, and then they'll really be upset with me. And what every person does, they go through that litany of questions, and they go, they push their computer away, and they go, I'll come back tomorrow. They procrastinate. That simple act of pushing your computer away when you initially are ready to go. You got everything. You got your email. You got your link. You got, you're ready to go. But that simple discomfort causes that fundraising effort to fail by 50% right there. And every day that you continue to procrastinate, add another 5%. So the goal of fundraising the goal is to make this efficient, to have high yield, and for me, and what's the cornerstone of everything I live by, is to be respectful. Be respectful. Have the right person, make the right ask to the right person at the right time. You do that, you will fund your nonprofit, you will fund your university or your, or your school, and if you're a candidate, money will not be the reason to raise your hand to run for election or for office or not. And that's the number one reason people choose to run or not to run. Can I raise the stinking money? That's not the reason. You should run because you want to run. You should run because you think you can make a difference. And money should not play that role. So this is about lowering the bar. This is about saying, I'll raise what I need to raise to get out my message. And uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> He's good at that. And, um, and so that's what the vision of RevUp software was about. Uh, and now, if you'll give me the privilege here, let me show you what we did. So, RevUp software is data analytics. It is not the money. We do not, we're not the crowd funder, we're not NGP, we're not any of, the, any of the companies that the money goes through for the transaction. We're not the system of record. We're data analytics. We are a tool for staff to act more intelligently. We're, and, and more efficiently, but most importantly, my passion is we're a tool to give volunteers in any line of what they're trying to do, give them the tools so that they can be in five minutes, in 15 minutes, do more than they ever could have done if they committed 15, 25 hours to it. So with that, um, I'll just show you one. We, have, we had 50 client, over 50 clients in the last year. I'm just going to show you this one because it's been in the news recently. So this is a political version of it, Ro Connor for Congress. When a client signs up with us, when they reach out to us, the software needs to understand who's the client. How do we differentiate this person, this client, versus, you know, a thousand other clients? So this only takes three, four minutes of customization, but it's required. So 
Uh, our team does it with the client. Ro Khanna, he's a South Asian male. He's 40 years old, born in Philadelphia. He's a Democrat running as a challenger to the incumbent for California House 17 at a federal level. 5,400 is the maximum contribution. He went to Chicago undergrad, Yale Law School, and his opponent was Mike Honda. But then this is what we call correlated campaigns. And this is completely flexible. You can add, take away. These are individuals, elected officers, other candidates who, who the client believes they're highly correlated with. So that if someone were a donor to one of these folks, if but they knew of Roe, they'd probably be interested in supporting Roe. And then here are some of the key issues that this campaign is, is about. Okay, so now the software, the algorithm, knows uniquely who the client is. And again, nonprofits, universities, same exact customizations. So every campaign gets, every client gets a certain number of licenses, in this case 10. So I'm given one of them, this is live, and allows me with one click of a button to upload my LinkedIn contacts, my Gmail, my Outlook, my vCard, if I've got any spreadsheets. As we go mobile, we'll also be able to add Facebook right now. And it, it allows me to, in my case, I uploaded nearly 3,000 LinkedIn's, 6,500 my personal Gmail, 1,400 of my professional Gmail. Uh, it dedupes them, it cleans them up. And when I click on Analyze, it then goes out to 150 political giving databases, federal, state, all 50 states, and over 100 municipalities. But then it also goes out to nearly 9,000 charitable giving databases. And with that, it takes those 9,000 plus databases, puts it against my 7,400 net contacts, puts it against the unique profile I just showed you, and here are my contacts, my friends, uniquely ordered, highest to lowest, likely to be interested in supporting Ro Khanna, the client. Um, and this is page one, and it's 25 per page, and I've got 300 pages. We're not going to go through 300, trust me. Um, but uh, the way to read this is this is synced up with your account. So this knows if someone's given in the past, given in the present to the client, in this case, Ro Khanna. John Doerr has given quite, a, he's been quite generous the last couple of years. Uh, he's maxed out, so that's why he's got zero capacity remaining. I'm not going to reach out to him. Now, Imad, on the other hand, has given in the past. That's low hanging fruit. Go get him. Click. David, on the other hand, has never given in this race, so that's Greenfield. That's a brand new person that's high, a good high prospect. I may, may want to re reach out to him. Uh, Laura is someone who has given, and she has remaining capacity, so I may may not want to reach out to her. But now, Wayne is someone who's a dear friend, who's a supporter of the opponent. I no longer will reach out to him. I will be respectful. I will not piss off a friend. Uh, which is one of the worst things that you can do in political fundraising. And so that's just an e early warning that, um, you know, to skip him. Um, and Oren is someone who has never given in this race, but has given to other similar races. So if he's interested in Raja, maybe he'll be interested in Roe. Click. Now, any one of these folks that I want to know more information about, so let's say, um, whoops, let's say Ron Conway is an example. Oops. Oh, sorry, it's the screen here. Oh, can't do it. Um, yeah, the screen's not letting me. There we go. Okay. So for Ron Conway, here's, he's given to charter, he supports charter schools, he supports youth programs, gun violence prevention, Clinton Foundation, Tenderloin Development, and then here's all his federal giving on the right, here's state giving, here's uh, local giving. It gives you a good overview of the things that might, he might care about, he might be interested in. And there's all sorts of other things you can do. You can do uh, various types of filtering. If I just want to go after people that are the low-hanging pr fruit, people that have given in the past but not currently, one click, you can do that. Um, I, a whole bunch of different things. My favorite is this one called Diamonds in the Rough. What is diamonds in the rough? Diamonds is every single person here has given to this client. However, they've given at a level that is statistically significantly less than they typically give to other similar clients. So all you got to do is reach out to them and they'll probably be likely to give you more. For instance, one of those spam emails, give 50 bucks, fine, that one resonated, you write a $50 contribution, now you're in the system. Well, now 
that person typically writes $2,000, $5,000. Well, if the staff just knows that, now there is a person you should follow up with because they just happen to only give you $50. So there's all sorts of different types of things you can do with filtering. You can do advanced filtering. One of my favorites is, let's say I want to do an event for women, and I can take my six, 7,000 contacts with one click, and now they've all been filtered according to if they're likely to be a woman, it's 98% accurate um, from a, a gender prediction capability. And we can do all sorts of things from geotargeting, et cetera. Um, but that's the top line of the software. Uh, we can do that for nonprofits. We can do that for higher ed. There's one more thing that I'll, I'll share here, which was kind of our secret sauce. So here's an individual, Ahmed Zavery, and I'll end with this and I'll open for questions. Um, Ahmed's someone who had two, three years ago had never written a check before to politics, ever. This was empty, this was zero, that was empty, and he had a score of 43 and it was purple. Well, why would Ahmed score 43 if he's never done anything for politics? One would think he would be a zero. Well, a fundraiser, not me, but a South Asian fundraiser reached out to Amit and said, Amit, you know, you're South Asian, you're male, you're in tech, you live in Northern California. You scored 43. You might wanna meet this guy, Ro, you might like him. And he did, and he wrote a check, and then he wrote another check, and then this cycle he wrote a number of checks. He even used a software and held a fundraiser in his home, and he raised $35,000. And this is the first time and the only thing he's ever done in fundraising. So for Roe, what we saw was in, typically in politics, 95% of the money that, that campaigns raise comes from pre-existing political donors, which is about 1% of the US population. Only 5% is new money in, new blood. And I'm all about growing the pie. It's just, right now, the way the system is, it's just easier, if you're a finance person, to just poach one another's donors. And that's why so many of us, when you write a contribution, all of a sudden you start getting hit up uh, with emails from people you've never heard about, because a lot of people share lists, and we all hate it. With Roe, only 30% of his donors were pre-existing. 70%, two out of three of his donors, and he raised nearly $8 million uh, in four years, were from first-time donors. And that's good. I'm a Dem, I want that to happen with, with Dems, but the software is completely nonpartisan or bipartisan, we work with everyone. Um, I like getting new people into the system. And so that's the way the software works. And so, you know, if you can, um, you know, we had 50 clients last year, we launched, uh, we, we worked with Purdue University where they're alpha, now we're fully commercial on the, the beta uh, for universities and higher ed. We're working with a number of wonderful nonprofits at the national level and a couple of local ones are starting to work with us. But the goal for us is to have it be about efficiency, yield, and respect. And with that, you know, I'd love to answer any questions for the last couple of minutes. All right, any questions for Steve? Let's get a microphone. Sabrina. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. It's really well timed since the election just occurred. Um, having uh, used Nation Builder, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this technology is different and how possibly the two could work together. Exactly. Yeah. So, the great question. So, um, Nation Builder does a one a, a number of. Um, unique functionalities in the space. Uh, they, they would be a system of record. They, in many cases, compete against NGP uh, on the left or against any of the Republican shops. Uh, but they don't do data analytics. So they would be a partner of ours where, where it said row the data going up and down of who gave in the past. Rather than, we work with Nation Builder with a number of clients. That data would come from them and we supply we supply the data analytics. And so a client who pays Nation Builder, a client that pays NGP on a monthly basis for the ability to have transactions go through their system, they would separately be a customer of ours where they'd be paying us a thousand bucks a month for 10 licenses for us. So we collaborate on that. Great question. Other questions? In what way have you thought about the 2018 election and the new American majority, like Steve Phillips and Amy Allison's work to mobilize the new American majority? You said you're going to go mobile. Will that smartphone access be a new 
approach for the next election? Yeah, so great question. Again, we are only on the revenue side. We're only on the fundraising side. We don't do field. We don't do any of the you know, wonderful technology that uh, there are a number of great ins firms that are, are doing that. Um, but you know, we are going mobile. So what, you're, what you just saw right now is the desktop version, which is staff and volunteers doing fundraising from their desktop. Uh, but what we'll also have in a couple of months, we, this is our mobile. And upload your contacts, upload your Facebook, um, analyze my contacts, and here view my rankings, same thing. Now I can write there, call Kevin uh, if I want to call or text, and if I want to take my um, my uh, call sheets information, have it all be seamless. This app will take something that today is a 15-hour process and do it in about eight minutes. So, but we are only on the fundraising side. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. One more. Carol Marks. Carol, I'm going to give you my microphone. Hi, Steve. That was wonderful. Um, I'm curious, is there training that you also provide for staff that might be making these calls that's a, kind of a different nature, not just the use of the software, but... Yeah. No, that's a great question. So it, as part of any you know, commercial relationship, it's not that we just give you the software. We have a team of people that help with the onboarding and help with the training. And so as we deploy with you, there is a major training that we do for the staff. And we also let them include as many you know, volunteers as they want. Um, and then we also kind of, we bend over backwards and help these folks beyond the initial deployment. And, you know, Ashley, who's on my team, who's here, uh, you know, is always on the phone all day long sharing best practices of, of, of the various functionality. I only showed you probably about 50% of what the software does. You know, it's a five minute demo. Um, but yeah, no, it's important. Uh, a lot of these folks uh, don't use software or they use software that, I'm not kidding you, looks like it's from 1998. That's that's the industry, as we all know, especially in the nonprofit space. There's a couple of vendors out there that innovation is not part of their DNA, uh, but they've got large switching costs. So, um, so we're here to help, and we have a whole team of people that you know focus on, you know, handholding uh, as we get into the 21st century data analytics world. Okay, let's give Steve Spinner a round of applause. Thank you so much, Steve. That is a very powerful tool on display right there, not only for politicos uh, like myself, but civic organizations. So uh, please check out RevUp. So I now have the uh, great honor of transitioning to our award ceremony as Warren makes his way up here. When Warren and I were discussing our vision for Connect 13 three years ago, we both saw the need to recognize individuals and organizations that are making a difference in government through the use of technology. As we heard this morning, the technology is all around us. It's what we do with it that matters. We're looking for individuals and organizations that have not only embraced technology, but have used the technology to enhance and improve how government functions and improve the lives of the people that we serve, our constituents. How is technology allowing government to be more responsive and better address constituent needs? How have services been elevated? We're looking for vision and leadership and equally important results. We're looking for those who have set the standard. And I think that our selection of Ann Campbell and her team at the San Mateo County Office of Education fit that description to a T. I will turn it over to Warren to talk more about our honoree. All right. Oh, that, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Is Ann Campbell here? Yeah. No, I see her. Sit down. No, nope, not yet. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure you hadn't left. This is a surprise. So Ann, Cam Ann Campbell, uh, the county superintendent of schools for San Mateo County, is known, well known, in fact, for promoting equitable access to digital learning in San Mateo County. She saw the writing on the wall when the state moved toward online testing and she knew that local districts would need to upgrade their networks, their infrastructure, 
and their capacity to achieve a state of readiness to successfully conduct the Common Core assessments. For her, assessment was not the only driver of this upgrade. Understanding the transformative potential of digital learning and wanted districts to understand and act on the imperative to grow their bandwidth to meet current and future digital learning needs. Now, I have to apologize to Marco Chavez because he wrote 17 pages of bio background for Ann, and I'm cutting it down here real time. <clears throat> Ann has also made efforts to close the digital divide in San Mateo County. She engaged School to Home, a program designed to bring technology into low-performing schools throughout California. A home to School targets families without home computers and broadband and helps them get connected through low-cost connectivity options and district-provided devices. How cool is that? Home to School also engages parents as key learning partners and provides professional development for teachers on how to facilitate digital learning. Through Ann's leadership, School to Home has been successfully implemented in two schools in San Mateo County, and she has aspirations to do all the other schools in this great county. Uh, Ann Campbell has encouraged the, uh, the County Office of Education to apply for broadband infrastructure improvement grants, and um, she actually did work up at the county's Camp Glenwood uh, facility up in the, up in the hills. Uh, here, and the motto was really to leave no student behind. Leave no student behind. So the final thing I'll say um, is that Anne really gets the idea of big data. She just doesn't talk about it because she understands it. She loves it, and I love it too. She invited me to be on a big data uh, committee, and um, very pleased to serve on that committee with you, Anne. And thank you for your leadership. And so for those reasons, and a thousand other reasons that Marco had in his bio that I'm not going to go through, we want to call you up, Ann Campbell, and recognize you and salute you. And we're very proud to recognize you as our Connect 2016 honoree. Let's give it up for Ann Campbell. Hello. So I really like the box. So will you look at this? This is the Connect 16 Award from the Superintendent of Schools. Kevin and I would like to present that to you, and we would invite you, I think, to say a few words if you could. Wow. Well, I don't know about 17 pages, Marco, but thank you for all of that. Um, you know, I look forward to November every year. Part of that has to do with pumpkin pie, but the other part has to do for the last couple of years that I know that Connect is coming. And having been to each one of the Connect events that Kevin and Warren have sponsored over the years, it's always just a tremendous highlight to be here and I learn so much. So thanks very much and I think you join me in thanking Warren and Kevin and Roseanne from San Cita for sponsoring today's event. It's been great. I also want to uh, talk a moment about um, two kids, and one is my daughter, Emma, who is a senior at Sequoia High School, who is just a hop, skip, and a jump away from here, and her friend, Sonia, who is also a senior at Sequoia High School. Both of those individuals are in the International Baccalaureate Program at Sequoia. And when you're in the IB program at Sequoia, you submit all of your papers and various things that you have to do to get your IB diploma uh, by online. Emma comes home to our house and walks in the door. We have a variety of iPads, iPhones, Kindles, laptops, desktops, you name it, we've got it. Emma comes home to work on a paper, sits down at her laptop, produces her paper, sends it off at midnight to her teacher. Her friend Sonia lives not too far away from here in a two-bedroom apartment. Her family has five people in it. They share that apartment with another family. And there is one device in her family, her father's cell phone. 
and her dad works several jobs, comes home 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, for Sonia to submit her paper that she's been working on, she has to do it by texting it into her dad's cell phone, and then it goes off to the teacher. That is an example of a very profound opportunity gap that we have here in San Mateo County. And I accept this award today on behalf of the San Mateo County Office of Education because we are absolutely and totally committed to disrupting that opportunity gap. And I think what today has demonstrated <laughs> What today has demonstrated to us is that the way that you disrupt the opportunity gap is through partnership. And it can be through partnership with public entities, and I really have to do a call out to uh, John Walton, the Chief Information Officer for um, the County of San Mateo, who has been a terrific thought partner for us at the County Office of, of Education as we thought about how do we get our kids access 24-7 so that that opportunity gap doesn't happen to the California Emerging Technology Fund and School to Home where we're working in Daly City to get all of the kids in middle school and high school there online so that they can work from home uh, and really be part of our digital culture. Certainly to many, many nonprofits, but also to the corporate sector. And you saw wonderful examples here today of Genentech and Oracle who are so involved in the communities. My challenge to all of you would be no matter which part of the equation you're on, whether it's the public sector, or the private sector, the nonprofit sector, or just as an individual who lives in San Mateo County, I really challenge each and every one of you to take up that idea of partnership as a way to disrupt the opportunity gap, because that's what it's going to take for all of us to move to the future and for every single student in San Mateo County to graduate high school, to go on to college and career, and thrive in our increasingly digital culture. So thank you very, very much. All right. Well, it's your turn, Warren, turn. It's, your turn, it's your turn, but I'm afraid if I don't do this right now, I'm going to forget. So I'm going to hijack the microphone. All right. When we conclude, we are going to adjourn to lunch. I've been told to mention to all of you that um, we're requesting that you use the forward tables, the forward tables in the room, because we're going to be sharing the space with box employees, and we want to be a a respectful uh, a user of the space here. So please use the forward ta tables. And then please return your trays to the back of the room. The tray return, large green sign, large green wall back there, that's where you return your trays. Warren, Good job. it's all on you now. <laughs> Thank you. In the interest of time, I think we said we were going to stop at 11.30. We're going to end at 11.30, so I'm going to talk real fast here. We have about two minutes. But we want to stay connected with you after this event, and I hope you've downloaded the app. Um, there are signs on the table in case you haven't. But later on, a couple days, we're going to send a question out through that, a couple of questions actually out through that app to you. First one being, what did you do with the information you learned today, and who did you speak to about it? And the second is, what hit a chord? What hit a chord? What hit a chord uh, that you then talked about with that person? So that's going to be. Um, a question that's coming through the app. I encourage you to download it, and that's a way that we can all uh, stay con connected. So Kevin's going to thank our sponsors, and then I think we're going to do the, wa the Apple Watch announcement, who won, and uh, I'll turn it back to Kevin for sure. a moment. Before we do that, just want to publicly recognize the sponsors again of Connect 16, first box for opening their doors to host this event for their staff, support, and technical expertise. In particular, we'd like to thank Chris Ye, Senior Vice President of Product, who you met this morning, and Addie McClure and the staff who handled all of our logistics and facilities needs today. So thank you so much to Box. Second, Sam Cita, the San Mateo County Economic Development Association, and Roseanne Faust. We're proud to have her as a partner. And she and Amanda Borsom were instrumental with lots of behind the scenes support. Thank you so much, Roseanne. We'll give uh, all these folks a big round of applause at the end. And then our, at the end, at the end, at the end. That's all right. 
Uh, and our other event sponsors, the County of San Mateo and the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce. We want to thank Bridget Michelson and Rocky Robinson of Penn TV. Uh, a big thank you to Supervisor Warren Slocum staff, Carol Marks, Marcy Dragon, Maya Perkins, and Irving Torres. And a very special thank you to my district office staff who are with us today, Mario Rendon, Zach Ross, Susan Kennedy, Ben Cohn, Carol Ong, and Virginia Kroger. Let's give them all a big round of applause. So you saw Mario Rendon passing a yellow paper to me and we were in crisis mode there for a moment because you know we're having this um, thing for the Apple Watch, right? And the, the person that scored the most points on the app was gonna get a, a brand new, out of the box, Apple Watch. Problem is, something we hadn't planned for came up. We have a three-way tie. And so we're gonna make the executive decision we only have one watch today, but we're right now going to make the executive decision. I wasn't told about this. <laughs> I don't like surprises. Your campaign fund pays for the second one, and mine pays for the I third. Need, I need rev up. <laughs> but in any case, we have a three-way tie, and we're going to get the other two people um, an Apple Watch one way or the other. But let me announce those, those winners, okay, if I could? So the, and you have to be present to win, is that right, Marcy? You have to be present to win? Well, whatever. Okay, the first, the first person is Adam Juratovac. There Adam's he is, right the there. House. All right. And maybe you can read that for me, Kevin. Yeah, this could be like an Oprah thing where it's like, everybody gets an Apple Watch. <laughs> That's coming next year. How many points did he get there? I don't have my reading glasses. 20, 24,804. 24, Congratulations. Now... The other two folks that had the exact same number, Brian Carey. Is Brian here? Back in Brian's the back. Brian's in the house. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, our very own panelist, Melissa Michelson. Yay. So as we like to say, the Apple Watch is in the mail. Don't stress. So we adjourn? We are adjourned. We will see you all at Connect 17. Thank you all for being here.